Okay, guys, welcome to lecture 12 of Introduction to Quantum Computation. This is a new lecture for the summer 2021 offering at Paderborn University. And the topic of this lecture is going to be stabilizers and the Gottesman Knell theorem. Okay, so to open the lecture, uh, let's start with our usual quote. This time it's from Arthur Schopenhauer, and it's the original quote is actually in German from the 19th century, but uh, this is the English translation of it. And it goes as follows. So the problem is not so much to see what nobody has yet seen as to think what nobody has yet thought concerning that which everybody sees. Okay, and so let me, um, you know, augment that with um, an anecdote which I had, uh, which goes along the same theme, right, um, which I read once upon a time, and it turns out it's actually not true, at least uh, according to the internet, it's actually not true, and uh, the anecdote goes like this, right, so apparently when uh, Niels Bohr was a young scientist, right, um, he's asked on a physics exam, you know, how should you compute the height of a building using just a barometer? Okay, and so there's some kind of standard physics answer, right, that, you know, you'd use the barometer to measure pressure maybe at the base of the building versus the top of the building and so forth. But uh, apparently Niels decides to be a wise guy and, you know, rattles off a whole list of other ways to accomplish this task without giving, you know, the expected answer in some sense, right? So, you know, you, some of the things you could do, right, if you know nothing about pressure is you could throw the barometer, well, more accurately, you should gently drop the bar barometer off the top of the building, you know, measure the time to impact and, and use that to estimate the height of the building. You know, if you want, you could uh, hold the barometer up and let the, the sun shine on it. And then based on the angle this makes, you can calculate the height in the building and the time of day and, and so forth, right? And again, you know, this anecdote, it turns out, um, is likely more fact than fiction, right? But both this and the quote at the start of the lecture, right, they really have the same theme, which is that a lot of times it is useful to have multiple perspectives on a problem. Okay, each of them might give you a completely different insight. And that is precisely going to be the theme of this lecture and of stabilizers. Okay, so in particular, what we've seen so far, right, is that, you know, if I had a quantum state psi, right, and this was typically an n qubit state, right, the way we, say, tracked the, the evolution of an algorithm, a sequence of gates on psi is, you know, we really explicitly tracked the full state vector psi. Like, often we, we of course, worked in the, the ket formalism, but still, in the worst case, you know, the overhead of the simulation is going to scale with the dimension, 2 to the n, right? But maybe, maybe the as the quote uh, on top of the lecture suggests, this is really just an artifact or a drawback of the fact that we're just working in this explicit representation of the state, right? We're really just kind of expanding the state in the full, uh, say, standard basis, right? And tracking those amplitudes, right? Maybe uh, there's a more clever way to do this tracking of the evolution of psi as we apply gates that won't result in this exponential overhead. So in this lecture, the main thing we ask is, is there an alternate representation of uh, you know, quantum state psi, uh, which allows efficient classical simulation of quantum circuits? Okay, so th this is the goal of the lecture, and remarkably, the answer is sometimes yes, okay? And so there are two parts to this answer, right? There is the sometimes and there's the yes. So first let me explain the yes, okay? So, you know, off the top of my head, there are two very prolific frameworks that have been developed over the last uh, 20 uh, or so years, right? They are... Um, if you come more from a condensed matter uh, physics type background, there, especially from a quantum information perspective, there the, the study of so-called tensor networks has really um, dominated uh, the field in terms of um, a really nice way to simulate certain types of quantum circuits efficiently or represent certain quantum states uh, efficiently. But in this lecture, we're going to focus on um, an arguably even slightly earlier framework, at least that's my understanding of it, which is the so-called stabilizer framework. I mean, okay, so that's what we're going to focus on. And basically what both of these frameworks allow you to do, right, is that, and this is going to be the sometimes part of it, is that in certain settings, for certain types of gates, for certain types of circuits, right, um, depending on your constraints, sometimes you can get away with an efficient simulation of your circuit um, if you use one of these frameworks, okay, to view your state psi in an alternate perspective 
rather than writing it down, you have a much more clever, succinct, compact representation of it. Okay? And in particular, the stabilizer framework, um, basically what we can simulate is something known as a set of Clifford gates, meaning that it's a set of gates, which includes some really interesting quantum gates, right? Um, Non-classical gates, that we can efficiently simulate with classical overhead. And this is the celebrated Gottes McNeil theorem. And this is, in some sense, the main motivating theorem that we're going to aim towards proving by the end of the lecture, um, at least sketching the proof of. Um, okay. But really, um, I really want to take the time in this lecture to really get you comfortable with the stabilizer framework. Okay, there's a lot more that can be said about the, stabil um, the stabilizer framework, by the way. Um, a huge application of it, which is super important, is the study of quantum error correcting codes. And to be honest, initially, that was my goal of this lecture when designing the lecture, and I really wanted to talk about error correction. But, you know, the more I, I kind of started fleshing out the lecture, and the more I realized, you know, I think it's really worth taking a full lecture just to think about the stabilizer framework to get used to um, representing quantum states in an alternate way and to really understand, you know, the computational advantage of this, never mind error correction, which is a huge other application in its own right. Okay, so we're not going to talk, in the interest of time, we'll not talk about error correcting codes in this lecture. That, again, that could fill an entire book on its own, frankly. So certainly it should have its own full lecture some other time. Okay, so today we'll focus on stabilizer framework in the context of simulating quantum computations. This is, of course, at the forefront of uh, this topic is at the forefront of quantum research right now. Right. Um, so there's this whole hullabaloo about um, so-called quantum supremacy experiments um, running in the lab, actual experiments, right, that conclusively do something, uh, at some task, no matter how silly the task is, in a quantum setting, right, in an actual lab better or much faster than can be done classically on a classical computer, right? And so, of course, um, there's this interplay here about, um, you know, what can we do quantumly versus what can we hope to simulate with a classical computer for careful enough, right? And so this lecture is saying, well, here's a whole class of circuits that we can simulate classically. Those go um, via the stabilizer framework. So by the way, I, you know, as I write down the title of the first uh, section, you know, there have been to date uh, at least two, I think maybe even three quantum supremacy experiments now. The first one being uh, on the so-called uh, superconducting and obviously we're allowed to have fun in this course, you know, we don't just do work. And so there are two main platforms so far um, that have been demonstrated in the lab. And these fall under the guise of uh, superconducting qubit platforms is the first one. So this, is, this was in 2019, I think, uh, which was a, a very large collaboration between Google, a bunch of US and a bunch of German institutes, basically. So they conducted um, a so-called random circuit sampling experiment on superconducting qubits, right? Don't ask me what that means. And um, so that was considered kind of the first arguably good uh, proof or demonstration of quantum supremacy uh, much more recently. There was, uh, in 2020, and I think there was a recent experiment just a few weeks ago in 2021, there was a completely different platform um, known as Gaussian boson sampling, basically. So this is in linear optics. And this was done by um, a collaboration of Chinese institutes. And the, the Gaussian boson sampling is a little bit near and dear to my heart, a bit more in the sense that uh, it was co-developed as a, uh, a framework for demonstrating uh, quantum supremacy uh, by our quantum physics team here at the University of Harabon. So, but again, that's just some fun stuff as to some of the latest and greatest is what's happening in the field. Let's talk about the stabilizer formalism because that is something that has applications far beyond simulating classical circuits. We could also do things, like I said, regarding quantum error correction, which is a very important field in its own right. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with intuition, okay? So let's just kind of play around. Let's make a few first failed attempts at uh, what might be a reasonable way to proceed to to alternately try and characterize quantum states. And of course, the, the life lesson there um, is that you should always cherish the mistakes you make, okay? The mistakes you make will ultimately be excellent sources of learning, obviously, so I know it's easy to get hung up on them. Try not to do that. Try and see the bright side. In the long run, you'll thank yourself for making the mistake, frankly. Well, at least most of the time. 
Okay, intuition. So, what's the first place we might start to try and uh, think of an alternate, like if we're just brainstorming, an alternate characterization of quantum states? So, the first attempt I want to, at least for somebody like me who, you know, first, in some sense, first started in the field thinking about things like entanglement theory, you can try to expand your state in the Pauli basis. And this is not quite going to work, but it's going to get us thinking about the Pauli basis. Right, that's kind of in some sense why it's here. Man, I'm bad at drawing straight lines. Okay, so what is this attempt one about? So attempt one, what it says is that, um, you know, what do we know so far? Well, we know that a state psi and an n qubit state psi can be written in the standard basis. Right, so this is... Uh, no surprise to us right right now. So that requires writing down explicitly two to the n amplitudes, right? And each of which is a complex number, so each of them also has um, two parameters. So what you may not have thought of is that um, just as there's a basis for cat psi as a vector, what is also true is that we can think about the density operator. Density operator rho, right? In this case, let's just think about a pure state, right? So this is a linear operator. Right, that acts on C2 to the M. Okay, and it's actually uh, more, okay, more accurately, maybe uh, let me be clear that I really want to focus on Hermitian operators right now. So this is a Hermitian operator acting on C2 to the M. It's also positive. Right, you can actually um, write this in terms of a matrix basis or an operator basis, right? So there's a, just like there's a basis for vectors, like, or at least column vectors, let's say, um, you know, it's also extremely natural to talk about a basis of orthogonal matrices, okay? In terms of an operator basis. Let me do this in red. For um, the space Hermitian C2 to the M. Okay? So maybe we should start first by thinking about the density operator picture. And so um, the basic example here is that, you know, let's just think about first for a qubit as the guiding example. So any Hermitian operator that acts on just C2 for a second, so it's a two by two Hermitian operator, you can always write it as rho equals um, A, B, there'll be four parameters, okay? identity plus Pauli X plus Pauli Y plus Pauli Z. Okay, so the red terms are the, the variables here or the, the parameters, if you will. The red terms and the black terms are the basis elements, right? So here I'm claiming that the, the Pauli um, identity X, Y, Z operators form a basis, okay, for the space <coughs> And, um, you know, of course, to make this rigorous, we need to define a notion of an inner product, and, you know, we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay? But what is true is that, you know, you can expand any uh, single qubit density operator or Hermitian operator in this form by cleverly choosing A, B, C, and D. And um, the nice thing is that these things can even be chosen to be real. Okay? So unlike the amplitudes, you know, in this representation, where I have potentially a very large number of complex numbers here, you know, um, you know, I'm just specifying real parameters in some sense. Okay. So this is the first insight I want to give you, right? And something again that you could take away from this lecture, even you, even if you end up saying, "Oh, I hate stabilizers. I never want to think about them again." Um, don't forget that you can always expand, let's say, a single qubit state, in terms of this basis. So let's do an important example because it, we're going to use this tool again, or this, this type of notation again in the rest of this lecture, which is exercise 12.1. And what this exercise basically says is that let's expand the projector onto 0, 0, right, which is just uh, the density operator for cat 0 in terms of the Pauli basis. Okay, and so what it is, is it's really just a half times identity plus Pauli z. Okay, so in other words, uh, in this example, we set, in terms of the expansion, right, we set I, A equals to D equals to a half, and B equals to C equals to zero. 
right? I'm just, if we look at this expansion up here. So, why is this true, by the way? I, I need you to understand this exercise. So, you know, do take a moment to pause the video right now and really try and make sure you understand this expansion without, I don't want to see any uh, vector expansions or matrix expansions. Like, don't write things out explicitly. Use spectral decompositions. Why is it true that this equation holds? This is very important that you understand this because otherwise the rest of the lecture will slip away from you very quickly. Okay? So, pause. Think about it. I think I'm out of coffee, unfortunately, so I cannot just take a sip. So I'll just wait patiently and then let's continue. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to think about it. Why is this true? Well, think about it this way, right? How do we diagonalize these guys? Well, identity is just 0, 0, plus 1, 1, right? And poly z is just 0, 0, minus 1, 1. Okay, so now if I add these two guys together, uh, the, the one part is going to cancel out, right? And we're going to get two times the zero part. And that's why we have this renormalization to bring us down to just one times the zero part. Okay, that's it. There's, there's really nothing clever here. It's just think in terms of spectral decomposition. So one other thing I really want to point out, which is, uh, again, a really neat fact to know, we're not going to use it too much in this lecture, which, but it's that any single qubit density operator rho can always be written, so any row can be written as a half times identity plus rx, so some parameter rx. I mean, this is the ABCD. These are the parameters I had before. Um, R y, Z. Okay. So right now, all I'm saying is, you know, of course I can expand row is going to be a density operator in this case, and so it's going to be Hermitian, and certainly I can apply this expansion so these are just the, the parameters B, C, and D, right, in the expansion up, up here. But there's one parameter that's missing, right, which is A. And so why is A missing, right? I, I, I didn't write down an A here. Where, where did the A go, right? It's a constant now. And the reason is because rho is normalized, right? It's a density operator. Um, and, uh, well, okay, the main reason is because it's normalized, right? So I need the trace of rho to be 1, and that's why this is fixed. Right? Because trace of rho is one, there's really only one choice for what can go on the identity. Because if I look at these four terms, i, x, y, and z, only identity has a non-zero trace. If you think about the trace of x, um, it's just zero, right? I mean, take a moment to pause and write down trace of x. You'll see that it's zero, right? It just adds a diagonal element. So that means that the only term that contributes to the trace is this uh, parameter a. And so since I need the trace to be one, you know, the choice of a is fixed. I don't have a choice. And now the other thing that's really nice in the, this is only true in the single qubit setting, by the way, which is that, you know, this vector, rx, ry, rz, right? This is, by the way, what we call a block vector in the literature. This thing's norm is at most one. Okay, so, um, and it turns out that you can say quite a lot in the case of a single qubit. You know, if the norm is exactly one, it corresponds to rho being a pure state. And if the norm is basically zero, then you get, you know, that will, if the norm is zero, that means all these parameters are zero. So that just wipes out that part of the state. And therefore the only thing left is the identity. So when the block vector is zero, then it basically says that you have the maximum mixed state on a single qubit. Okay, and the, the highly non-trivial thing is that any vector, um, by the way, this is a real vector again. So just like this is just the representation I'm talking about above. Any vector of norm at most one will result in, on this left side, will result in a positive, well-defined density operator rule. Okay. When you start going to higher dimensions beyond a single qubit, you can still talk about a block vector, but it's no longer true that all the block vectors you write down will result in positive operators. They, might, they will be Hermitian, but they won't necessarily be positive. Anyway, that's an aside and a whole other discussion, right? But I, I just want to, this is a very nice fact to keep in your tool belt, okay? How to expand a single qubit state. Good, okay, so what have we learned here? The point here is that any single qubit state row, I can always expand it in terms of, you know, a unit vector or something smaller than uh, norm one in R3, okay? So that's great. 
does this now remember our original goal was to track an n qubit state so does this really save us anything when we scale it up right because of course ultimately i don't care about a single qubit i care about n qubits okay so here's the question now does this scale up okay and the answer is well no okay this was for a single qubit so if this is the basis for a single qubit, what is the corresponding operator basis if I'm talking about an n qubit Hermitian operator, right? How many terms do I need? Well, as you might guess, you need an exponential number of terms, right? There, that, that's the number of degrees of freedom there are. And so if we generalize this basis, identity x, y, z, which is just a single qubit to n qubits, right? It turns out that a, a valid choice of basis, there, there's there are many more choices, but you know the choice we'll look at is this one here. Is just you just take tensor products of Pauli operators. This is it. Okay, so don't be scared by this notation. What you do is just you have n sites, and on each site, sigma i, you choose one. So on each site i, you pick an operator to put down, and that's just going to be one of the Pauli operators. Okay. So this is a set of operators, and I claim that this is going to be basis for the n qubit Hermitian space. Okay, so let's just do a very quick example. If you want to talk about, say, um, a two qubit Hermitian space, what's the basis? Well, uh, what this says is that you just take all possible pairs of Pauli operators and ten take tense product, right? So I can do, so P2 is what? It's just, it's a set of identity tensor identity, for example, identity tensor Z, identity tensor x and so forth dot 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 all the way to the very end you know we get things like y tensor z and finally the very last one might be z tensor z okay so there should be a total of how many terms well i've got two slots two qubits and each one there are four possible choices of operators to put down so there's four squared equals 16 elements okay and, and that is i'm claiming a valid operator basis for a two qubit Hermitian space. Okay. And, you know, let me not uh, disrupt the discussion. I'll come back to the notion of an inner product in just a second. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that, um, you know, generally the size, um, the size of this set PN, the number of base elements you need for this n qubit Hermitian space is what? Well, again, there are n sites, and in each site I could pick four elements, i, x, y, z, right? So that's four to the n elements, right? So that means that if I were to uh, expand, you say my, I have my arbitrary uh, quantum state rho, and I could always write it as the sum over, um, you know, pick your favorite basis element, right? And for that basis element, you're going to have you know, some, some real, this is the, these are my red, right? This is just a real number, right? You can always expand it this way, but the point is that this vector R, right, of all these coefficients, that's going to be in real four to the n, okay? No good, no dice, okay? So we haven't really saved much. It's still an exponential overhead to track the state in this way, so we're going to have to um, go back to the drawing board. That was attempt one. Let me just very briefly, as an aside, touch on, you know, why this is a basis, right? Uh, sorry, this one over here. At least, you know, let's talk about what it means for these operators to be orthogonal, right, for a basis. And so for that, you know, we have to define the notion of an inner product, right? I mean, that, that's how we define orthogonality. And so the inner product you use when you talk about what's the inner product of, let's say, you know, one element of Pn versus another, well, we use the so-called Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. Okay, and what that basically says is that if I have the inner product of two operators A and B, right, so the very abstract notation for inner product are these angled brackets, right, so when I talk to my optimization friends, you know, they always like to write these things down and it, you know, well, drives me a little crazy, but, you know, it is the, the correct notation, okay? And the way we define the inner product is it's a dagger times b. And then you take a trace. Okay, so if you take any two of these Pauli operators and you take this 
a linear product of them according to this formula, what you will see, right, is that if the two operators are distinct elements of Pn, then you'll get an inner product of zero. And if they're the same element of Pn, then you'll get something non-zero, right? It won't be one because you technically you need to renormalize things, but uh, it will capture the, the orthogonality we need. And this, by the way, is the content of exercise um, 12.4. So I, I strongly encourage you to do this exercise because this Hilbert Schmidt inner product shows up all over the place. Okay, so I feel like I had something else to say, but now I've forgotten it. So if it comes back, I will come back to it. Good. Oh, that's what I want to say. So the Hilbert Schmidt inner product might look scary and different, but really it's it's totally a sleight of hand. Okay, meaning that it's the exact same inner product that you're used to working with. Uh, on vectors, and the reason is because if you look at this formula closely enough, you'll realize that you could recover exactly this formula by you know taking the matrices A and B and kind of reshaping them into skinny long vectors, row and column vectors, so that taking the inner product of those vectors gives you exactly this expression in terms of matrices. So there's absolutely nothing new here. It's just a different way of writing it to account for the fact that now things are written in terms of matrices, not vectors. Okay. So now we need attempt two. That did not work. Still too many parameters. And what I like to think of this as, so the Pauli operators, I mean, they seem to be useful, but doing it in the naive way didn't work. But it turns out we can still get something out of this. And the way I like to think about it is in terms of so-called casting shadows on Pauli elements, basis elements. And I really want to be clear, like in the last years, in the field, you know, there's been a lot of very nice work on notions of things like classical shadows um, and shadow tomography. This is completely unrelated to what I'm saying here, right? That's a very nice line of work, has not, nothing to do with this though. It's just, I'm using the word shadow because this is the way I like to think about it because we're gonna think about, well, well, let's write it down, okay? So what's the basic idea for this second attempt? Again, I want to come up with an alternate representation of my state sign. And what we did in attempt one is, well, we used, you know, many bits, okay, and in particular we used, you know, four to the n, order four to the n, let's say, bits, to uh, represent one state, okay, and that was just some, that, that's kind of what came out of it, right, and so now let's, you know, kind of do the opposite, and now let's uh, use few bits, that's attempt two, to represent many states. Okay, so instead of one state, now it's many states. Okay, and the way we're gonna do this is in some sense to cast a shadow on poly elements. Okay, and let, I'll, again, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, this is well defined. Okay, and of course this attempt in itself won't work, but now it's gonna work better, and it's gonna kind of set the foundation for attempt three, which is when things start to go right. Okay, so let's consider an example, right? As always, you know, when you're first trying to understand something, play with the basics, right? Think of the simplest uh, examples that make sense, that are non-trivial. And so let's consider Z tensor Z tensor Z, okay? And from now on, throughout this lecture and for sanity, you know, everybody in the field just writes Z, 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 for example, we omit the tensor product, okay? We don't want to write it down every time. Okay, so again, this is qubits one, two, three, and of course, this is exactly the same. So it's just notation. And of course, this is just an element of P3, right? P3 was just this operator basis for um, right here. That's what uh, this P was, right? Okay, so this is just an element of that space. And, you know, the, the first key observation is this one, exercise 12.6, which is, Implicitly, um, we can think of this operator, z1, z2, z3, as representing, as a representation, a succinct representation of its eigenspaces, right? Because a cor corresponding to this thing, it's Hermitian and therefore normal, There's there are well-defined uh, eigenspaces according to which it diagonalizes, and those are some subspaces, right? We can think of this operator as representing those subspaces, right? It's some way to describe them. And so in particular, what we get is that um, z, 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 has precisely two 
eigenspaces e1 and e minus 1. Okay, and by that I mean um, the eigenvalue here is 1 and the eigenvalue here is minus 1. Okay, so e1 is a set of all vectors. Um, and so this is what I'm going to focus on. So this, when I write e1 in the rest of the lecture, I mean the one eigenspace. And so remember that e1 is what? It's a set of all vectors. In this case, it's a three qubit space such that v, z, z of psi is just equal to psi. Okay. And by the way, you know, if you're wondering where the term stabilizer will come from, it's basically this. We say that ZZZ stabilizes psi because, you know, just takes psi to psi. Okay. So why is this true? And, and, you know, here's one of the reasons why we like to work with this Pauli basis is because it's very easy to diagonalize the operator ZZZ, right? How do we diagonalize this one, right? Well, remember that, what is this? Well, each of these Z operators diagonalizes in zero tensor one, right? So this thing is what? It's um, zero. And I'll write it kind of in this vertical notation just to help you visualize this, right? The same thing three times. Okay. And so how do you get a basis for the full space if you know the local basis? Well, remember the tensor product uh, affords you this, right? If I take a basis for each of the local spaces and I tensor them out, I get a basis for the full space. So in particular, this says that ZZZ, of course, diagonalizes in the standard basis. And well, what are the possible eigenvalues you can have? Well, the eigenvalues you can have are what you get by you know, picking an eigenvalue here and expanding things out, right? So uh, here, well, let me not draw it that way. So here, you know, for example, in this bracket, I could choose an eigenvalue of one when I expand this out. And then I could choose, let's say, an eigenvalue of minus one. And then I can choose, say, an eigenvalue of one here. Okay, and so when I, when I write this thing out, dot, 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 you know, one of the diagonalizing elements is going to be 0, 0, tensor 1, 1, tensor 0, 0. OK, and what's the coefficient in front? Well, it's just, let me remove this. It's 1 times minus 1 times 1, right? That's, those are the three coefficients I pulled out. OK, and of course, this is just minus 1. OK, so you're staring at the projector essentially onto an eigenvector, which is 0, 1, 0 of eigenvalue minus 1. Okay, and of course, you know, for each way you can pick a term out of the, each of these brackets and expand it out, you know, you get a different eigenvalue potentially and a different eigenvector. Okay, so let's just clarify. This is just saying that ZZZ applied to 0, 1, 0 is just minus 0, 1, 0. Right, and this is kind of obvious if you stare at it because Z applied to 0 does nothing. Z applied to one kicks out a minus sign, and the number of ones is odd, so therefore there has to be a minus sign. Okay. And so if you stare at this long enough, you'll see that um, basically, you know, if we think about all eight different ways to kind of pick an element from here, from here, and from here, exactly half of them will lead to an eigenvalue of one, and exactly half of them will lead to an eigenvalue of zero. Uh, sorry, a minus one. Sorry. Okay, and that, that's why you get these spaces E1 and E minus 1. And the dimension here in this case will be 4, and the dimension here will also be 4. Okay, so we split the space exactly in half. Okay, so maybe while we're on this topic, uh, let me just write out, essentially do exercise, jump slightly ahead to exercise 12.7. And this basically says, you know, what is the one eigenspace of ZZZ, right? I mean, now we know that basically the eigenvalue is just going to be the number of ones I pick out, right? So if I pick out um, a one here and a one here, I get two minus signs, so those will cancel. And if I pick out the zero term, then it's positive one, so I don't get a minus sign. So whether or not I have a plus or one, uh, minus one eigenvalue completely depends on um, the number of ones I pick in this expansion. So in other words, you know, if I talk about the, the one eigenspace of ZZZ as an operator, what is it succinctly, right? It's just basically going to be the set of all x1, x2, x3, so standard basis elements, right? Such that, 
Okay, such that the hemming weight, oops, the hemming weight of um, x1, x2, x3 is a string, right, is even. Okay, there are an even number of ones. Okay, so remember these guys are each single bit. Okay, so this is a full characterization of E1, right? And actually what we can say is uh, this generalizes very easily, right? I mean, once you get it for three qubits, then it's also true more generally for n qubits, right? So generally, if I think about Z tensor n now, not just Z tensor three, right? Uh, has two eigenspaces, again, exactly two eigenspaces, and it works exactly the same way. You can only get eigenvalues one or two, uh, sorry, one and minus one, one and minus one, right? And each of them precisely two to the n minus one. So in other words, two to the n over two, it's half the full space, right? And so again, we'll get E1 of Z tensor n is going to be equal to uh, the set of all strings, x1 through xm, such that uh, the Hamming weight of x1 through xn is odd. Uh, sorry, is even. Okay? And, you know, the space E minus 1 will be the set of all odd weight having Hamming weight strings. Okay? And so there are an e the, the same number of even and odd weight Hamming strings, like on n bits, and this is why the two spaces have exactly the same dimension. Okay, so that's why the, the space here is the full space um, divided by two. Okay, there are two spaces, each have exactly the same dimension. Okay, so what is the conclusion so far of attempt two? The conclusion is that, well, how many bits do I need to write down to specify Z tensor n? Right, if I know I'm working in the Pauli basis, then technically I only need to specify order n bits, right? I just need to say at each of the n positions, right, which of the four Pauli operators am I using? Right? That's that's order n bits. To specify, right? If I want to encode that operator, this is enough. Okay? And how many states do we represent? Well, um, by writing down just those order n bits, well, we can think of it as implicitly representing uh, via E1 of Z tensor n, right? So I'm always gonna think about the one eigenspace from now on, two to the n minus one quantum states. Okay, so I just spend a little bit, I just spend order n bits, but I'm somehow able to represent a very large number of different quantum states implicitly in, in some sense, okay? So in this sense, I like to think of it as, you know, I have my Pauli operator uh, Z1 through Zn, and then um, you, it's like you cast a light on it, right? And then the light kind of falls on the ground, just like Niels Bohr's example in the beginning with a barometer, right? And the shadow, in some sense, is just showing you the one eigenspace. Okay, this analogy, right? This is not necessarily um, rigorous in any sense, okay? Okay, but of course, I don't want to represent, uh, if my goal is to show, as I started the lecture with, right, that uh, we can simulate the evolution of psi efficiently, you know, I don't want to represent two to the n, or you know, two to the n minus one quantum states, that's way too many, right? I need to cut that space down to some. And that's where attempt three comes in, right? The shadow in some sense is just too wide right now. How do we cut down the size of the shadow? Uh, cutting down uh, shadows via set intersection. So this is the, the attempt that will work. I mean, we won't get it formally, it'll just be an intuition right now, but this is the idea. Okay, so again, take a moment, step back. Imagine you're in this situation where, you know, you have this very large set, right? And the set is just too big, right? So how do you cut down the size of a set in, in set theoretic terms? Like you can do the usual set operations, right? Like union, intersection, and so forth. The way you normally cut down the size of a set is you take your set, which is way too big, and you intersect it with some other set, right? And then you hope that, you know, here's your set, it's way too big, E1 of, let's say, uh, Z tensor N, right? It's a very large set. And so what I do is I want to take its intersection with some other set, 
and um, intuitively, well, since we're playing this game of looking at more eigenspaces, it's going to be some other operator, right, that I'll plug in here, so that when I look at their intersection, you know, this space here, it'll be much nicer, it'll be much smaller, it'll be much more under control, right, and th maybe then I'll have some hope of representing psi um, using these operators, things like z uh, as the one eigenspace of, say, z tensor m. That's where we're headed, okay? So let's see exactly, you know, what do we choose as this question mark, question mark, to bring um, the size of this intersection down. And again, let's just go back to our simple example, which was, um, well, okay, we're not going back, we're doing this example. So consider two operators, xx and zz. Okay, so so far we were just thinking the standard basis, uh, z1, z2, and so forth, uh, z1, z2, z3. Now I want to consider a pair of operators, okay? Um, xx and zz. And now what we can do is from our previous discussion, what do we know? Well, we know that, well, first we know that e1 zz is just like before. It's the set of all, uh, sorry, there's something I, which is slightly incorrect here. Um, it is not true that the one eigenspace is the set of all uh, vectors of this form, just simply because these are just standard basis states, right? Of course, and it's not a vector space the way I've written it, right? Well, of course, what I mean here is that you need to take the span of these vectors, okay? So that you, it's a linear space, right? It's got to be a vector space. So all combinations of such even Hemingway vectors. Same thing here, right? So it's the span of all um, x, right? Such that x in uh, 0, 1, 2 has even uh, Hemming weight. So this we know from before, right? This is just the case for, for um, two poly operators. And now let's think about what is xx. Well, remember that how did we come at this um, definition here? Well, we basically diagonalized z, right? And then just looked at the plus, one, plus minus one eigenvectors locally and how they multiplied out, right? And remember that x and z have a very nice relationship, right? x is the exact same thing as z. We just, you know, concatenate or conjugate with the Hadamard, right? The, the eigenvalues stay the same, it's just the eigenvectors that change. And so, you know, we can immediately write down uh, what this space should be, right? It's going to be just like before with, uh, I'm going to need a minor twist, right? So right now it's, all of this is the same. So it's all in black. So um, nothing is changing. So what changes between, you know, the first definition and the second? Well, it's the fact that here I need to switch bases, right? So I do a Hadamard on qubit one and a Hadamard on qubit two, and that's going to be the space. And in particular, I can, you know, because I'm only working on two qubits, it's not difficult for me to explicitly write down all of these states, right? So this is the span of what? Well, what are the even Hemming weight strings? Well, they are 0, 0, and 1, 1, right? There's only two uh, in this space. And here we do the exact same thing, right? So I write, say, uh, 0, 0, right? An even Hemming weight string, but then I do Hadamard, tensor Hadamard, right? And so what is that? That's just plus plus. Okay, and likewise, the analogous state is minus minus. Okay, so now I have two operators, and each of them casts a shadow, right? ZZ uh, projects onto uh, 0, 0, 1, 1 in this sense, a shadow onto that, and um, XX projects onto uh, plus plus minus minus, right? And so now we ask, what is the intersection? Okay, and I'm not going to do this exercise just yet because um, in a second, we'll do something else that will make it even um, very clear. But this is the basic premise, right? So now if I take the intersection of these two sets, what happens? They used to each have two elements, here and here. Now we get the span of one element, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Okay? Magic. Okay, so now essentially what I have is an alternate representation of the Bell state, right? Here's the Bell state, C plus, right? This is an entangled state, this is not a classical state or something like this, right? Instead of explicitly writing out the Bell state, right, I instead took two of these Pauli operators, right, and I took the intersection of their one eigenspaces. And then the only state left in the space 
was this bell state. So now I have, you know, in the future, if I ever want to represent the state, I could write it out, or I could just give you the operators x, x, and z, z, and say, look at the intersection of their one eigenspaces, then you'll get the exact same state, state out. Okay, magic. Okay, so, um, and that's gonna be the name of the game, right? We're always gonna be doing this kind of thing where we take a list of operators now, we, we keep taking intersections so that the, the size of the space we represent gets cut down, and ideally we wanna get to the point where we're always representing a unique state implicitly via these so-called shadows. Okay, so I said magic, right? But you might wonder, well, is this black magic, right? I mean, it seems really kind of convoluted. You know, how in the world am I even going to know if I take intersections of these one eigenspaces, right? Um, that I'll get anything interesting, right? Um, how do I know that I'll get, let's say, precisely one state, some unique state like I did in this case? And the answer is actually not that bad. So the answer is coming. Um, so the question is really, you know, how to get um, meaningful intersections, let's say. Right? Because if you just take you know arbitrary states and you start inter um, spaces and you intersect them, you know that the intersection might not be interesting at all, right? So that's coming. The answer is coming. So just hold tight. I know you're excited. Okay, but let's really take a moment to point out a very very crucial property. This works in this case is a very strong necessary condition, and I'll, we'll talk about this more, of course, because xx and zz, the operators I choose, they commute. Okay, remember this means that xx times zz equals to zz times xx. Okay, so the order of multiplication does not matter. Okay, and so remember what that means is that whenever um, two normal operators commute, if and only if they commute, remember this means that they simultaneously diagonalize. Okay, and what that means is that there exists one orthonormal basis I can choose, right? Uh, it may not be unique, but there exists at least one basis, right, that I can fix. And relative to that one basis, both xx and zz look diagonal. So you might be wondering, you know, how in the world does this help us? Well, let's explicitly do this. Um, I'm not going to do the exercise, but I'm going to write the answer of the exercise, right, and I'll let you work through it. Let's see which basis x, x, and z, z simultaneously diagonalize in. And as you might guess, right, since I get the bell state here, it should have something to do with the bell state. And indeed it does. Right, so this is phi plus, phi plus, uh, minus, phi minus, phi minus, plus, psi plus, psi plus, minus, psi minus, psi minus. Okay? And how about z, z? Well, you're going to have the exact same base elements, maybe to really emphasize that it's the exact same projectors, I'll just do this, right? So the projectors are the exact same. What changes are going to be uh, the, let me be clear, what changes are going to be the eigenvalues, okay? I mean, there's still going to be plus minus one, you're still going to have one times here, but here you're going to have uh, plus one times here, and here you're going to have minus one times, so maybe, again, let me be precise, or consistent, I should say. And here you're going to have minus one times. OK? So we have a fixed basis. It's the bell basis, right? Here are the four elements. Both of them diagonalize relative to this basis, right? Because these are, I'm just summing orthogonal projectors. So you're staring at the spectral decomposition in particular. And the eigenvalues are plus minus one for both of them, right? They both have an even number of plus and minus one eigenvalues. Right? This was the same argument we made earlier. It's just a matter of where do those plus and minus one, plus one and minus one eigenvalues go, right? So here I have, we care only about the plus one space, right? So the plus one space of xx is here and here, right? And for zz, it's here and over here, okay? So what's the joint plus one space? Because they both diagonalize in the exact same basis, I could now trivially say that the joint one space is the span of this basis vector, right? It's the only one where you share a plus one eigenvalue, okay? That's just the definition of the joint one eigenspace. And so this immediately tells us, well, I, I don't need to rewrite it, basically tells us exactly this, that the joint one eigenspace of both operators is zero, zero, plus one, one. 
Okay, and so more generally, when we talk about operators beyond xx and xz, this commutation property, this, this is the idea you should keep in mind. We're going to need everything to pairwise commute because we can play exactly this type of trick. Okay, good. So that is the intuition of what we're going to do, okay, with stabilizers. We're going to write down these, uh, what I'll call Pauli strings eventually, right? Uh, and they're all going to pairwise commute. And we're going to look at the intersections of their shadows, their one eigenspaces, and that's going to implicitly be a representation of the quantum state I'm interested in. Okay. Now, before I do any of this, you might wonder, you know, why in the world am I doing this, right? So a huge reason is quantum error correcting codes. We will not get into that. Uh, another huge, huge reason, however, which I will get into, is the Gottesman Knell theorem. So let me just state the theorem. This is theorem 12.10, right? And basically what it says is the following. So quantum circuits consisting of the following can be efficiently simulated. Classically, of course. Okay, so what are the ingredients? Well, so one and three are going to be the standard ingredients we always have when we talk about quantum circuits, which is that for my quantum computation, the start state is just all zeros. Okay, so I'm talking about an n-qubit system. And at the end, we're going to measure in the standard basis, right? This is also what we always like to talk about. And what that means is that the observable, remember, one way to define the observable is it's got to be diagonal on the standard basis, and the natural one that we typically use is just z tensor n. Let's say you want to measure all the qubits in the standard basis, you could measure observable z tensor n. It diagonalizes in that basis, and the eigenvalues are plus minus one. Okay, so those are kind of standard. The question is what goes over here, okay, because of course, in general, we do not expect to be able to simulate arbitrary quantum circuits uh, with polynomial classical overhead, because otherwise there'd be absolutely no benefit to quantum computing. And you know, if that's the way it was, then of course that's just fine and that's great. But you know, things like the, the quantum factoring algorithm make us really believe that this should not be the case. Okay? And of course, there's this whole other mess of quantum supremacy experiments. You know, let's not get into that, right? Again. So what gates can I apply so that I can still do the simulation? Well, it's got to be a subset of all possible gates. And the gates that we're allowed to apply are going to be the following. We've got Hadamard, C0, X, Y, and Z, right? And we're going to have one more, which is the so-called phase gate. And this is a very simple gate. It just injects an I. So it's just like the Pauli uh, Z operator, except instead of injecting minus 1 on ket1, it injects the complex number I. So the claim is that if you can do these four, I mean, if you have a circuit that consists of, you know, some mixture of these gates, right? You can simulate that circuit classically efficiently. And you know, this is a highly non-trivial statement, right? Uh, because you know, we're allowing genuinely quantum gates like this Hadamard, right? And remember with Hadamard and C0, we can create things like Bell states and entanglement, right? So we've got you know the phase gate or the Z gate, which are these are genuinely quantum um, gates, right? There's they have no classical analog. So there's something really remarkable about this theorem. And what I really want to um, you know, point out, but I'm not going to spend any time delving into, uh, are just two facts, x size 12.11 and 12.12. .12. The way I've written the theorem is that you, know, you start in all zeros and you measure uh, z tensor n at the end, but you, know, you can generalize this. I mean, I've written it kind of in this most simple way, but of course you can generalize the statement of the theorem to um, you know arbitrary start strings, you know some some string x. It doesn't have to be all zeros, or um, we can do arbitrary uh, Pauli measurements at the end. It doesn't have to be z tensor n. This is twelve point two, twelve, right? So it doesn't have to be uh, this one here. It could be some other string of Paulis, right? We can do all these things, and intuitively, of course, the reason is because if I don't want to start with zeros, but something else, well, you know, I have the Pauli X gate at my disposal, right? So I can flip the bits of all zeros 
and write down any string I want to kind of begin the circuit anyway. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Oh, sorry, this is uh, 12 point, no, sorry, this is all 12.11. And x size 12.12, what it basically says is that, what about things like intermediate measurements, right? Can I simulate um, an intermediate measurement in the mid middle of the, uh, the circuit where we then, of course, use that uh, measurement result just to do classical conditioning in the future? And again, that exercise asks you uh, to argue that, you know, this theorem statement holds even if we also allow intermediate measurements. And here you want to use that principle of deferred measurement. I won't say more about that. Good, so this is the theorem. These are the gates that are allowed. Um, as I said, they are certainly not expected to be uh, a universal set of gates. We don't expect it to represent arbitrary quantum circuits. And the gates which are not allowed, right, the gates that would, in fact, if we added them, that would take us to a, a genuinely universal gate set to get arbitrary quantum circuits are things like the T gate, right? This is a very uh, important gate that sees a lot of study nowadays, right? And um, so that's the definition. You know, you can think of this in some sense as the square root of the S gate, right? Because if I take the square root of I, right, I'd get I as e to the I pi over 2. So if I take the square root of that, I'd get e to the I pi over 4. So T squared is just... S, right? So I can do S, but I can't do its square root, which is T. And the other thing is the so-called Toffoli gate, um, with, whose definition is not so important for our discussion here, so maybe in the interest of time I won't write it down. Okay, but that's also an important gate. You can think of it as it's a C naught, but that's conditioned essentially on two wires as opposed to just one wire. Good. So this is the Gottesman Knoll theorem. It's going to be kind of the main thing we're aiming to prove using the stabilizer formalism, of course. So that's going to be one of the big things we get out of it. Okay, so now we've got uh, intuition and motivation under our belts. So now let's go back to the stabilizer formalism, right? And remember there we're looking at talking about intersections of one eigenspaces of these uh, strings of Pauli operators. And let's formalize it, okay? And let's really understand, um, you know, what's happening when we take intersections, you know, can, what can we say, okay? So the first place I need to start is to formally define uh, the mathematical structure of these so-called uh, strings of Pauli operators. And that's going to be called the Pauli group. So the main mathematical um, framework we'll need is group theory, right? But I mean, we're not really going to explicitly use it in this lecture so much, just to give you a heads up. But you know, if you really get into the details of it, that's kind of where this goes. So, but let me just Throughout this lecture, to keep life simple, I'm going to make a definition, and I'm going to call an n, oops, an n-bit Pauli string. What I mean by that is just basically um, any sequence of the tensor product of n Pauli operators, right? So in other words, any operator of the form a tensor product of i equals to 1 to n, right? So uh, of sigma i such that uh, sigma i is a Pauli operator, single qubit, right? So, for example, z, 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 or uh, z, x, x, y, these are both 4-bit Pauli strings as far as I'm concerned, okay? That's just what I'm going to call them. Okay, so let's understand how these Pauli strings play, okay? What does their playground look like? Okay, so again, the name of the stabilizer game is that we want to take uh, joint eigenspaces of Pauli strings. Okay, that's what we said. And so let's just recall some basic properties which we're going to use over and over again. Number one. Well, okay, maybe first I'll say for any pair of Pauli operators, um, duh, 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 I, X, uh, sorry, let's see a little bit. Yeah, there's a typo in the sec, just the typo. Okay, so you need the Pauli operators for this discussion to be in X, Y, Z. So no identity allowed. I mean, identity is kind of trivial. It commutes with everything and so forth. And so if I is not equal to J, right? So pick, pick two indices that are not the same. Right, and what do we know? Well, we know that um, first, if I square any one Pauli operator, 
right? They're all square to identity, they're self inverse, right? So that, by the way, means that all the eigenvalues of Pauli operators, right, are, are plus minus one, right? Because those are the unique uh, scalars such that when you square them, they go to one, basically. And otherwise, when I think about sigma i versus sigma j, where i and j are different, remember these anti commute. Right, so if I swap the order, a minus sign gets kicked out. Okay, so um, that's this so-called anti-commutation. And the notation one uses for this is instead of square brackets like commutation, we have these curly brackets. And so we say the anti-commutator is zero. Okay. And the third fact we'll use, which is also important, is that if I take the product of any two, um, so I should really just say here, for all um, i, j, it uh, doesn't matter whether or not i and j are the same, sigma i times sigma j, um, okay, no identity, okay? So again, I'm, I'm really talking about poly x, y, z here. So the product of these two is always gonna be proportional to um, some scalar, uh, basically, it equals some scalar times the third poly operator. Well, okay, maybe I can drop this. I think I did a better job writing this in the notes than I'm dictating here. We'll just say for some uh, sigma k in the sum, right? So if you take any pair of these Pauli operators, doesn't matter which pair, right? And you multiply them out, you'll always get yet another Pauli operator, right? I, X, Y, or Z. Uh, you might have some, this is a proportional to. So you might have some scalar in front, right? You know, typically something like uh, plus minus one or plus or minus I, right? In fact, those are the only ones that are allowed. Okay, but you know, the space essentially is, what, okay, what's the point of this, right? It's the space is um, the poly strings are closed under multiplication, right? So if I take two poly strings, I multiply them together, I get another poly string up to a factor of plus minus one or plus minus i, um, little i, complex i. Okay, so that smells awfully like a group, right? Remember that in a group, um, one of the, the main properties is that if I have any two elements of the group, if I multiply those two guys together or apply the group operation more generally, I should get yet another member of the group. Okay, and so uh, multiplication of two Pauli strings gives me another Pauli string. So I, indeed, you know, the Pauli strings will form a group if we include the, the four scalars plus minus one, uh, plus minus i. So So this holds more generally, by the way. So this closure property um, up to a scalar of plus minus one, plus minus i, um, the product of um, any two Pauli strings is a Pauli string. Right, so for example, I could do, you know, x, uh, x times, uh, xz, for example, right? And what is that? Well, xx gives me identity, right? x squared is identity, but xc gives me, I think it's minus i times y. Okay, it might be uh, i times y, I mean, we could we can quickly do it, right? But the point is it's gonna be i up to a scalar, right? Uh, so what is this? This is just uh, zero, uh, zero. So these guys should be zeros, right? Zero minus one and one over here, right? So this looks awfully a lot like i, except um, this should be minus i times y, because normally I have a, a minus i in the top right corner of y, okay? Uh, sorry, maybe this is a plus i then. Plus i, yeah, okay, so I, I take that back, this should be a plus i, and let me get rid of the plus, okay? So again, we keep in mind that this is a, a tensor product, right? So it's really i, y, and again, to be super, super clear, I really mean this, right? So this is very good. The product of two Pauli strings is yet another Pauli string. And the other thing we really care about in a group um, is that we want to talk about inverses, right? Every element of the group should have an inverse, a unique inverse. And that's basically exercise 12.15, which says that um, for any um, Pauli string G, I mean, so G is just some Pauli string, right? 
there exists a unique inverse, unique inverse Pauli string. G prime uh, such that um, G times G prime equals to identity, tensor n of course. So, okay, so if we think about, for example, x z, you know the this is if this is my G, right? Then, in this case, the inverse is trivial, right? G prime is just x z again because each of them are self inverse, right? It gets you know slightly more complicated if you want to talk about uh, if there was an i here, right? Then I can't put i x z because that'll kick out a minus sign. So technically, then I would need to put a minus i here, and then I would still get um, identity coming out. Okay, so you always take the exact same Pauli string. It's just you might need to update the sign in front. Okay, so in particular, you, you basically just need to take the star of the sign in front. So I, I'm not going to prove this, but I mean, well, that sort of is a proof. It's very simple. And so basically, what is the conclusion? What's our starting point, the springboard for this discussion? Is that um, basically the set of all Pauli strings, so I'm going to define the set Gn. What is this? This is going to be the set of all Pauli string, so just this was my definition of a Pauli string, right? I take sigma i. Each of these guys is one of the four single qubit Pauli operators. And the one thing I need to add here is that I need to allow scalars, right? Because, you know, as we saw over here, right, if I took x times z, I got i times y, right? I need to be able to include the i, otherwise I'm not closed under multiplication. So I'm going to allow scalar c, and the scalar scalars that are allowed are plus minus one and plus minus i. Okay? So this thing is basically, um, is, and this is called the Pauli group. Okay, that's what this is. So this is a group under multiplication. Okay, so that's the starting point. Now we understand the structure of how, you know, each of these Pauli strings plays together in some sense. And throughout this, well, you know, what we're going to do, of course, is like, just like before, you know, we're going to take not all the Pauli strings, right? We're going to take some subset of them, like we did xx and zz, for example, and then we looked at the intersection of their one eigenspaces. And we want to do the uh, same thing here. So instead of talking about the full group, of course, I want to talk about subgroups, right? And so um, the notation I'm going to define here is that for any, which is standard notation, for any subset S of this full space, Right, of this whole group, we're going to let you know this notation, uh, these angle brackets S, uh, which will be some subset of G n itself, right, be the subgroup generated by S. Okay, so what that basically means is that you know S is some subset of these elements, and um, you know what are all the elements of G n I can obtain by just multiplying out elements of S. Right, so if S was say xx and zz, well then um, this thing also includes, you know, xx, uh, zz, but also their product, right? So um, xx times zz is what? Well, we already saw that it's um, i times y and i times y, and then you, you could simplify this further, right? For example, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me scroll this up so you can see it. Okay, so that's the subgroup generated by my generating set. So let me be clear. S is always going to be my generating set. Right, and once I have that, then by taking all possible products, I get the full uh, subgroup. And that's all I want to say about the Pauli group, right? So the playground, the sandbox we're allowed to work in is a set of all um, Pauli strings up to scalars of the form plus minus one, plus minus i. And this is very nice. It forms a group. I can multiply things together and I'll stay in the group. Uh, I won't fall out of the sandbox, right? Um, for every operator in the group, there is a unique inverse. Good, so that's my play space. And now, of course, I wanna play this game where I take um, sets, uh, you know, generating sets now S, and I wanna look at uh, their, the joint one intersection of, say, these operators, okay? And so let's study that next. So joint one eigenspaces of Pauli strings.
Okay, so what's the goal now, right? The goal was, so uh, let me see here. How easy will it be to screw up? Okay, it's responsive, that's good. The goal was, you know, if we go back to um, here, for example, you know, we the generating set we had, so here we're talking about P2, which, um, sorry, G2, which meant the Pauli group on um, streams of size two. Okay, and the generating set I chose was XX and ZZ, right? And the intersection of the one eigenspaces of that was nice. It was just a, a unique state, which was great. It was the Bell state. And so now I want to ask more generally, you know, I pick some subgroup S, right, my generating set, and I want to ask, you know, what does the intersection look like, basically, right? And in particular, I want the intersection to be, most importantly, non-empty, because otherwise, if it's empty, my, my, uh, my stabilizing, these generators are not representing anything, they're representing the empty set, right, that's silly. Um, and ideally, of course, we want to get to the point, at least for a discussion of the Gottesman Knoll theorem, we want to get to the point where we're really representing a unique state in that joint intersection. Um, so let's restate in words the goal right now, the, the simple goal we're first going for is we want to pick, we want to pick a generating set as, right, such that um, the eigenspace, the joint one eigenspace of that set, okay, is not equal to the empty set. Okay, it gives us something interesting. So we're giving an implicit representation of some set of states which is non-empty. And you know, equivalently, we could of course say that the dimension of that space is non-zero. Right? I mean, those are equivalent statements. Okay. Uh, and then the reason why I'm writing it this way is because later we'll have a nice characterization of when we can get this type of property, and it's going to be stated in terms of the dimension of the space. Okay. So one minor thing that you know I want to clarify uh, right away, which is that you know we're going to typically work with you know writing down a generating set and then thinking about the joint one eigenspace. But of course, um, ultimately what matters is you know the the subgroup that it generates, right? All possible products, et cetera, et cetera. And so we first need to argue very quickly, right, that it doesn't really matter if I work with the generating set versus you know the full uh, generated set. If all I care about is say the one eigenspaces, uh, the joint one eigenspaces of these operators. Okay, so this is just exercise uh, 12.16. I'm not going to prove it, but the point I want to state it, which is that fix any state psi doesn't matter which. Oh, sorry. Any generating set S in the Pauli group, and then what you can show is that for all uh, state psi, right? Psi is going to be in the joint eigenspace of S, right? This is what we were talking about so far, right? So if and only if Psi is in the joint eigenspace, not just of S, but the full generated set S, okay? So in this example, right, that means that, you know, if I have a state that's in the joint one eigenspace of these two operators, that will be true if and only if you're actually in the joint one eigenspace of not just those two, but, you know, everything else you can get as a product as well. Okay, this is you know not difficult to prove. I'll leave this to your imagination. But the point of this is that you know in our discussion we're just going to focus typically on the generating set S itself. So I'm not actually going to write angle brackets around because kind of we get once I prove a statement for the joint one eigenspace here, we're going to essentially get it for the full generated subgroup immediately via this exercise. Okay. So, because now, remember what we did is, you know, the name of the game is we take intersections of sets, right? So this is the one eigenspace of xx, this is the one eigenspace, let me be a little bit more precise in our example, and then what we cared about is the intersection, right? And now, you know, if we just think set theoretically, like forget all the stabilizer stuff for a second, right? So what's happening here is that, you know, in this example, I had two uh, generators. I had XX and ZZ earlier. But of course, you know, you know that means I have a, a generating set of size two. And now, of course, I could add more generators and more generators. I could have a third one, right, that goes like this, right? Let's just say this is E1 of, say, YY now, right, for example. And then, of course, I'm not interested in uh, 
the full, I really want the, the true intersection of all three now, right? That's the joint one eigenspace now. And so as you can see, I mean, uh, naively here, the more operators I add to my generating set, right? The smaller the intersection gets, right? Because I'm just taking the intersection of more and more sets now, right? And so each time I add a, a new generator to my uh, set S, right? And I'm, I take the joint intersection of each one of these sets, you know, the intersection will keep cutting down uh, the size of the joint intersection, this red part in the middle, okay? And so of course there's the danger that, you know, if I add too many elements, right, or the wrong kinds of elements, that the joint intersection will go to zero, it'll be empty. And so this is uh, one of the things we need to be careful of. So, um, so the idea is that, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me not write that down because I already said it. Uh, so, oops, and then I cared about this, right? But basically, it is possible to have an empty intersection, of course. And so here's kind of what will turn out to be the kind of criteria, or one of the criteria, which is that if you choose minus i as being in uh, your generating set, okay? And in fact, you know, this holds more generally. I could, I could put this as well, right? So minus i should not be in the subgroup generated by your generators, because otherwise um, we get immediately that the space that you stabilize is empty. Okay, so this will turn out to be a very serious um, roadblock. Okay, and so I mean, let's just imagine for example, oh, you know, why is this true? Let's just imagine, for example, that um, minus i is literally one of the generators. I mean, you could generalize the proof very easily to the case where I put the angle brackets in. But then what does that mean? Well, that means that, you know, um, consider any psi in the stabilizer, right, in the one eigenspace of S, right? So that means that if I hit psi with anything in S, I'll just get psi back, right? So this Im implies that by definition, um, minus i times psi, right, is supposed to equal psi. And this is because uh, since um, minus i is in the stabilizer. Psi is in S and uh, psi is in E1 of S. Okay, that's what's supposed to happen, right? But at the same time, of course, you know, if you just stare at this for literally half a second, you'll see that, well, literally minus i times psi is just minus psi. I mean, that's just the definition of that product, right? And so now I have a problem, right? Because now I have minus psi equals psi, right? The only way this can happen is if psi is the zero vector, like not ket zero, like literally the scalar zero, right? And so this means that um, this intersection, in fact, must be empty. Okay. Right there, there's there's no way to have some non-zero, non-trivial vector in that space. Okay. So this is a very strong barrier, and we'll see this come up again. But this is an example of where um, minus i should not be in your set. And let's look at now a follow-up example as to let's leverage this minus i, okay? Because in some sense that is kind of the the roadblock. And let's look at 12.18, and now let's consider this set. So before we had the generating set x x z z, right? So let's look at this one, right? Let me add a y y in here now. Okay, what is the joint one eigenspace of all three of these guys? Right? I want to know what is this thing. And I claim actually that now we've gone too far. Okay, we've added one set too many that I claim that that red space is actually empty. And why is this true? Well, consider what is in the, the generated set S. Well, the generated set S contains what, what's in S? Well, I could take products of these generators, right? So I can certainly take xx, I can take times zz, times yy. Okay, by definition, this is in um, not S, but the, the subgroup generated by S. Okay, and what is this equal to? So I'll let you work it out, but basically here's a fact, and I encourage you to pause the video and just verify this on your own. If you do x times, uh, sorry, let me um, write it in a different way to get my signs right. Let me put uh, the z here. I mean, otherwise, mm, well, actually it doesn't matter, they commute. Okay, it doesn't matter, they pairwise commute. So this is fine. But basically if you write x times y times z, 
this will give you um, i times hidden. Okay, so I encourage you to just literally do the matrix multiplication of two by two matrices, and you'll see that the product of these three is in fact the identity, but up to i, right? And what that means is that when I multiply these three terms together, I will get um, i i tensor i i. Right, and what is that? Well, that's just minus i. Okay, so ta-da, I found a way to generate minus identity in my subgroup, okay? And so that means that this thing cannot stabilize any states that are not just a scalar zero, okay? No non-trivial state. So the intersection must be empty, right? And uh, the argument is just, it's literally this exercise, right? Because then you can run this contradiction argument. Okay, so that, that's interesting, right? I mean, because before we just looked at these two operators and there we really got something cool, right? We got the intersection was the Bell state. But as soon as I add the third operator, the YY, all of a sudden, you know, the, the intersection goes to zero, right? So what gives, right? How come this happened, right? And it turns out that, you know, there's a very clean characterization of when exactly you'll get uh, something non-zero okay, as your intersecting space. And not only that, but we'll even be able to tell, you know, what precisely is the dimension of that joint one eigenspace. So, we talked, uh, we defined the Pauli group. We talked about how to formalize this idea of joint one eigenspaces. And now let's talk about a clean characterization of how to pick the generating set S. So here's the theorem, I'm gonna write it down, and this is essentially what we're gonna prove um, over the next little while. And after that, we'll go ahead and essentially prove the gottesman knoll theorem, or sketch a proof of it. And this is just basically a theorem for how do you get a non-trivial, meaning the set, the generating set should give you non-trivial, a set of states that it stabilizes. Oh, by the way, um, I don't think I ever explicitly said it, right? Um, but when I pick my uh, generating set S, you know, E1 of S uh, is the stabilizer. Sorry, other way around. The set S is the stabilizer of E1 of S. Okay, that one eigenspace. This is the, the terminology we use. Okay. I mean, I've already been using it, uh, but there you go. Let me write it formally. So, so pick any generating set, right? Then E1 of S is non-empty. Okay, so this is what we cared about, right? This is the condition we wanted. I want that the joint subspace to be non-empty if and only if two conditions both hold. So, as we saw, this is absolutely a necessary condition, right? We cannot have minus identity in, um, okay, I just need to be a little bit careful. This uh, this is a typo in the notes. This should be, a, we need to be in the subspace generated by S because I mean, here we already see that in this example, right? I mean, there's no minus identity in S itself, but certainly we can generate minus identity. So I need to really talk about the full subgroup here. And the other property um, we need is that good old property we saw in our uh, discussion on intuition, which is that for any pair of operators in S, they need to pairwise commute. Okay, and this just ensured that uh, they think simultaneously diagonalize, and so it makes sense to talk about in a very clean way to talk about these joint one eigenspaces. Okay, and let me be clear that both of these need to hold. Okay. So what this tells us is that you know, it gives me a necessary and sufficient criteria for how to choose S so that um, I'm guaranteed that I will have uh, a non-empty joint one eigenspace. Okay, so my, my weird alternate representation of quantum states is really doing something non-trivial. So far, it says nothing about the dimension of this joint one eigenspace. I'll get to that shortly. Okay, and then of course, there are two directions here. There's an if and only if. So the first direction is you know, to show that these things are necessary conditions, right? That if they don't hold, then you're in trouble, right? Um, I don't know why that happened. 
So, oops. So that these are necessary conditions is we've sort of already seen, well, we've certainly seen uh, this one. This one over here was the previous exercise. Exercise 12.17. Uh, right up here, right? So that was this exercise. So certainly that's a necessary condition. What's not clear, of course, is that it's also sufficient, right? But it's certainly necessary um, by previous exercise. And well, what about um, this one? Um, why is the commutation actually necessary? Like we sort of argued this intuitively before, but you know, let's just kind of uh, sketch through why it's actually necessary. So as for um, condition one, let's just prove that it's necessary in a second. And this will be via a pair of exercises, exercise 12.20 and exercise 12.21. So the first thing is that you know if we fix, what I need to understand is you know, what does it mean to violate this condition, right? Because I'm gonna argue that if this condition does not hold, if it's violated, then you cannot have a non-trivial joint on eigenspace. So the question is, what happens if it's violated? Okay. So you know, fix your generating set, and fix any a and b in this generating set. Okay. And the claim is that um, if these guys don't commute, right? So if we violate uh, this condition up here, right? Then there's really only one other thing that can happen, right? Then a and b anti-commute. Okay, this is the claim. Okay, so and this holds for any pair of elements and intuitively, I mean, okay, in general, of course, this type of claim does not hold, right? If I take any pair of square operators, let's say, and they don't commute, then of course, it's not in general going to be true that they at least anti-commute. This is not true at all, right? The reason why this holds basically is because um, A and B are Pauli strings. So they're all going to be strings of this form, right? You're going to have strings like this, right? Um, let's say A might be something like, um, you know, I times X, uh, oops, some no commas. I'll, I'll just do proof by sketch. Uh, X, uh, Y, Z, let's say, and B might be something like um, minus C, uh, Z, uh, Y, X, for example, right? And if I look at the product, right? A times B. Oops, I think I need to reload my journal at some point. If I look at the product A times B, right? Then, or whiteboard, uh, A times B, then what is it really? That's just minus I, the scalars come out, and then I have, you know, X times Z here. Uh, well, that's um, essentially it's a scalar times I, right? So it's um, XZ, I think, well, we did this, right? It was IY. And um, so I'll get y again here, i y here. And y times y is identity, right? That's this one. And now z times x is going to be what? Well, it's going to be minus i y. Oh, I really should write tensor products in here because it's getting messy. Uh, comma. Just waiting on the whiteboard to react. And OK, let's just, maybe it's faster to just rewrite it. Uh, minus i, um, so we said i y, tensor i y, tensor identity, right? Because that's y squared, and the last term is going to be what? Well, um, z x is minus x z, right? Remember the Pauli operators anti-commute, so this is why I get minus i y now. Okay, so this was x z, this one was z x, right? So that's why they're the same up to minus i. Okay, and so if I uh, swap the order. Right. I mean, uh, the only thing that's going to matter here is, in fact, um, you know, every time I, I swap the order here, like if I, I suppose I didn't even need to expand this out, right? I mean, um, if I have a times b, right? Um, so if I had i x x y z, right, and I multiply this by uh, minus z z y x, right? Then if I want to swap the order of this multiplication, well, that means that I need to swap these two, right, first on the first face, 
And x and z, um, they anti-commute, so when I swap them, I'll get a minus sign. So, so far, I've got a minus sign. But then I swap these two. They also give me a minus sign when I swap them. So now I had two minus ones, and those will cancel. So, so far, my, my phase is plus one. When I swap the order of the y's, um, well, y, y is the same as y, so nothing happens. So my sign is still one. But now I have this one additional x and z. right? And so now when I swap the order, I get a minus one. So this means that um, essentially, because we're just talking about poly strings, what does it mean to swap the order of the multiplication? It just means that locally on each system, we're just swapping the, the order of the two poly operators. And if those two poly operators are the same, you're in luck, uh, co they commute. But if they're different, like let's say, well, if they're different in both non-identity, let's say x and y, then if I do xy versus yx, then I get a minus sign. So the point is that the only thing that can happen is that the number of minus signs I kip, kick out is even, and then um, these two operators will commute, or the number of minus signs I kick out is odd, and then they anti-commute. Okay, so that's a, just a very quick proof sketch as to why this is true. So I really encourage you to sit down and, and work through that to really uh, convince yourself that this is true in general. And now um, I want to argue that um, using this fact, right, that if I have two of these fixed S subset of GM, just like before, right, and any A comma B, and if we have two of these guys and they don't commute, then I want to argue that the space stabilized by S isn't empty, okay? And suppose um, A and B, they don't commute, right? And so what we know by the previous exercise now is that therefore the anti-commute, right? A comma B is zero, which means um, that AB equals minus BA. Right? That, that's what the previous exercise told us. And so what can I do? Well, you know, uh, fix any psi in um, any stabilized state. And I want to argue again, just like before, that this psi is uh, going to lead to a contradiction, right? So. Um, what I know about psi is that, well, certainly um, it's stabilized by both A and B because, you know, A and B are in S. So I know that um, I can uh, first, you know, so psi equals to A psi, right? But that also equals to technically A uh, B psi, right? Because I can, these are psi stabilized by both A and B, so I can just kind of pull the operators out. But now, of course, I know that A and B anti-commute, so I can do minus B A. Psi. Okay, so that's because of this anti-commutation. And now I invert the previous game, which is I suck the operators back into the state. Right, so this is minus b times psi, and again, that's because these guys um, stabilize psi. And that just equals to, again, minus psi. Okay, so just like before, I have psi equals to minus psi. Problem, right? This can only hold if psi is uh, the scalar zero. So if a and b do not commute, or any two generators, uh, what's the, the crux, right? The crux is that if any two generators of um, my, well, here, let me show you again, right? So if any two generators do not commute, therefore they must anti-commute, and when they anti-commute, we can show that the intersected space must be empty. Good. Now, what we actually want to do is, um, so that's kind of the, the easier part. You know, the slightly harder part is how do you show that these conditions are actually sufficient to ensure that E1 of S is not empty? And I won't give you the full proof of this, right? But I'll give you the, the main idea. And, you know, it's enough to kind of understand how it should work more generally. Let me, however, so how to show that uh, these are sufficient conditions. Okay, how do we do this? And basically we can show something even stronger, something very quantitative, which is really nice, which is that if I look at 12.22, uh, this is the, what I call sta the stabilizer dimension lemma. Okay, and basically all this says is, uh, very nicely it says, uh, for any k between one and n, remember I've got an n-qubit system, and 
So what's k, k is uh, the number of generators I'm going to have, basically. So, um, so let's suppose that I fix a generating set um, g1 up to gk, right? So this is my uh, gk over here. And of course, this is a subset of gn. So just slightly to the left when it decides to respond. Um, okay, and we want this to be the, oops, here it goes. We want this to be a set of, so this is the K we're talking about, it's the number of generators. So be a set of independent uh, generators satisfying that previous characterization. So that was theorem 12.19. Okay, and you know, I haven't formally defined, by the way, you know, everything here so far should make sense with the exception of one word. So I'll take a moment to see if you could spot what is the one word that I haven't defined yet, right? This is always the first thing you should do, right? When you're reading something difficult, something technical, you need to understand what you don't understand. Okay, so you need to look at that statement and say, okay, which words here do I not understand? Because until you realize that, you're just going to stare at this thing and be just fuzzy as to you know, why don't I understand what's going on, right? It's because there are certain things you're, you're, you're not getting yet in the statement, right? And um, so in this case, what have I not defined, right, which could make things fuzzy in your mind is independent, right? So independent, you know, I, I don't want to define it formally, but basically all it means is it's the same thing as, you know, when we talk about vectors being independent, um, there are no sum of the vectors, you know, can give another vector in the set. Same deal with generators, right? Um, and a set of independent generators essentially just means that the subgroup they generate, right? If I remove one of the generators, then I really, uh, my subgroup gets smaller. I, I'm only able to represent a smaller group of elements then. Okay, so I cannot recover one of the generators by taking a product of some other generators and its um, inverses. So, but you know, the exact definition is not so important for our discussion, so I'm not going to write it down. So what is the conclusion, right? If you give me a set of independent generators, um, k of them on an n qubit space, then I can exactly tell you um, this thing here, I can exactly tell you the dimension of the space, uh, amazingly, right? And what is it? Well, it's two to the n, right? So two to the n is the full possible space, right? It's an n qubit space, so it, the more generators I add, the bigger k gets, the smaller the space is going to get. And the nice thing is that it scales very nicely. It scales via this expression. Okay, that's it. So what this says is that every time I add a new independent generator to S, right, so k gets bigger by one, the size of that joint one space, right, it, it gets cut down by a multiplicative factor of two. Okay. So in particular, um, if you want um, if you want a unique state in kind of um, as we were saying earlier, right? Uh, if you want this joint space to be unique, right? Then you need it's necessarily insufficient to have precisely um, k equals to n generators. Okay, so this is not just needs, but it's necessary and sufficient. Okay, so, uh, and that's going to be the name of the game when we talk about something like the gottesman knoll theorem, because there I want to represent really a unique state and then track the evolution of that uh, through my quantum circuit by using the stabilizer formula. Okay? So, and so essentially this also says that, you know, whenever I, I do have K, uh, conversely, whenever I have N independent generators, I'm guaranteed that the joint eigenspace is precisely one dimensional. Cool. All right. Okay, so how do we prove this lemma? It's a very nice lemma. It says exactly we need to know what we need to know. And so here's the proof sketch. So <clears throat> the idea is actually quite slick. And maybe the easiest way to visualize it is via something like pizza. Okay, so imagine for a second. You know, I want to make an argument about dimension, right? About volume or space or some area, right? So if I have a pizza, right? And I cut this pizza into um, a certain number of slices, say k slices, right? Then 
Um, and and um, each of the slices has equal size, right? So I partition the pizza into an equal number of slices, right? So there you go, right? Then we know that, and let's suppose that um, one of these slices is kind of corresponding to my space E1 of S, right? Then I know that, you know, because all the slices are equal size and they partition the full pizza, um, this thing must cover a quarter of the surface area of the pizza, right? So that slice is a quarter of the full pizza. And now, of course, what we'll do is we're going to make this type of argument, except, you know, pizza for us is going to mean, you know, this full exponential space, right? And this pizza slice, of course, is going to be just E1 of s, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of this um, n qubit space, we're going to partition it into equal slices, if you will, that are orthogonal in the exact same dimension. And um, <coughs> so we're going to partition uh, c2 to the n, right, into. Um, and instead of having uh, k slices, we're going to have 2 to the k slices, 2 to the k slices of equal dimension. Need to, sorry, need to scroll this up so you can see it, of equal dimension. Okay. And one of those slices will be E1 of s, and therefore we will know that all the slices have the exact same dimension. It's um, so all slices have dimension, you have the full dimension over the dimension per slice, um, sorry, the number of slices, because they all have equal dimension, and that's just 2 to the n minus k, and this is exactly what we wanted, right? So my the space E1 of s will be one of the slices, right? And all the slices have the exact same dimension, there are 2 to the k of them, and therefore the dimension per slice must be this. Okay, so this is the basic premise. So how do we um, formalize this idea? Well, the basic idea um, is that, you know, in instead of thinking about spaces, right, like these ones, like uh, E1 of s, we can think about projectors onto those spaces. And it turns out that, you know, with just a little bit of work, not it's really uh, fairly easy and nice, um, we can generate projectors onto, um, so given the generators s, we can come up with the projectors onto, um, if there are k generators, we can come up with two to the k um, projectors each of which we can prove um, maps onto an orthonormal or an orthogonal space, basically of the same dimension. That's the name of the game. So here's the goal. We're gonna, given S, right, which was our generating set, uh, and we know that, remember, S is independent, the generators, okay, and they pairwise commute. And, uh, well, do we need pairwise commutation here? Yes, we do. Okay, so these satisfy the conditions, of, uh, it's sufficiency, sorry, that's right, yeah. So we satisfy 12.19, uh, theorem 12.19. So we want to um, write down two to the k projectors, pi i, onto orthogonal spaces of equal dimension. Okay, um, and of course, um, let's just say pi one, it doesn't matter which one, um, projects onto, so, and the space that we care about, right? This is our goal. Okay, so of course, what I need to do is start by writing down the projector onto the space I care about, which is E1 of S. So step one, let's just write down the projector onto E1 of s. Okay, and now um, the easiest way to do this, I think, is just to continue with this running example we had. So I'm not going to give you a, a general write-up. I'll just show you how it works for this example, and this should give you all the intuition you need to generalize further. Okay, so let's just focus on this example again of xx dz. Okay, so what is the projector onto E1 of s? Well, we already had this exercise earlier, right? So remember that um, right at the beginning of this uh, lecture, we did this exercise that we said that the projector onto, let's say, the one eigenspace of z, which is this, that was equal to identity plus z over 2. Right? And it's not too difficult to see that if you want the other projector onto the other eigenspace, the minus one eigenspace, it's the same thing, you just split the sign. Okay, and remember this was just by looking at spectral decomposition. 
And so we're just going to literally plug in these identities. You know, the similar things hold for XX, for example. We're just going to plug in these identities, right? Because these are the projectors we want. And so, and then we just tensor them out. So um, the first thing I want to do is I want to define pi plus or minus XX and pi plus or minus ZZ. Right? And these are just going to project onto the plus minus one eigenspaces of um, xx and zz, respectively. So this is identity plus or minus xx over 2 and um, identity plus or minus zz over 2. Okay, so these are both projectors. You know, I, I, I'll let you um, convince yourself of that fact. You know, um, certainly they're uh, Hermitian and you could square them and you'll see you'll get the same operator back. And um, this is exercise 12.23. I won't do this explicitly because it kind of just follows from this type of argument again. But basically, um, pi plus minus xx uh, projects. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me be clear. I don't want plus minus. I really do want uh, the plus here. So the key point here is that you know I have two choices of sign here and two choices of sign here. So there are four possible combinations. But if I just look at the plus version of pi xx, right, this projects onto E1 of xx, and pi zz projects onto E1 of zz. OK? Um, Okay, so again, um, you know, intuitively the reason why this is true, remember, it's just the same argument as here. It's because you know when you take the spectral decomposition of xx, the eigenvalues which have eigenvalue one, they will add up. You'll get a one plus a one from the identity over two, so you get uh, you just project back onto those, and the eigenvalues that are um, minus one. Um, when I do the plus, right, then you get one from identity, you get minus one from x, and those eigenvectors will get cancelled out. Right, so that was the intuition. It's the exact same argument as this. So I won't go through it again, but just believe me that these are the projectors onto E1 of xx and E1 of zz. Good. So now I have projectors onto my two spaces individually, right? But of course, I care about not them individually. I care about the joint intersection. Okay, so what is the projector on E1 of xx, right? This I know separately. And I also know E1 of ZZ separately, but I want the joint intersection. And here there's a potential problem, right, that's worth highlighting, right? Uh, in general, okay, it's not true that if I have the projectors for spaces A and B, then the product of those projectors will be, okay, well, first let me say what is an naive guess. So the obvious naive guess is that you would say, oh, well, why don't we just do um, the two projectors I know and just multiply them out, right? That would be the naive guess, because the, each of them projects onto the spaces, so we just do one and then the other, and hopefully we're in the joint space, right? Um, so unfortunately, this is not true in general. So if I have the projectors um, pi A and pi B, Right onto two spaces A and B, right, and pi A uh, pi B does not necessarily project onto um, A intersection B. Okay, so in general, this is not true. However, again, we really stress that we have this black magic property that everything pairwise commutes, and when things pairwise commute life is usually easier. And that's certainly true here. Uh, it turns out that when uh, the operators in question, like A and B pairwise commute, then indeed pi A pi B is a projector onto a joint space. So here, um, we don't get lucky, I mean, in the sense that they commute, because we designed it so that they commute. right? So certainly convince yourself, by the way, that xx and zz do commute. right? Um, so this works because, um, well, because of this, okay? So that's very nice. I have the projector onto um, the joint eigenspace, uh, joint one eigenspace of E1xx and E1zz. 
Okay, so that gives me the projector onto my desired space. And now I want to talk about the projector onto, um, remember the name of the game was that I wanted to come up with, well, I wanted to come up with two to the K projectors onto orthogonal spaces. And in my uh, example, K is two, I have two generators, right here they are. So that means that I want to have four projectors, each of which are going to map onto orthogonal spaces. And I have a four dimensional space, right? Um, because it's two qubits. So that means that if I have four orthogonal spaces uh, in a four qubit space, each of those spaces must have dimension one. Okay, so ultimately what I wanna prove is that the space this thing projects onto is dimension one. Okay, so with that said, um, how do we get the next question? How to get three other projectors onto orthogonal spaces? Okay, and the answer is in exercise 12.24 which we'll sketch, but basically the claim is that, so this is the one I had already, right? So if I project onto uh, ZZ, right? That was one of them. But what I can do now is that, remember that, you know, I made a point to stress that, uh, you know, when I defined these projectors here, right? I really said that there are two settings here, right? I could do um, plus XX or I could do minus XX, right? And the one I cared about was plus XX and same thing here, right? So, I mean, Coincidentally, there are four settings here, right? I could use plus minus here and plus minus here. So uh, the total of number of possible combinations is four. And that's not a coincidence in any sense. So now I'm gonna put in all the possible combinations. Um, let me maybe just write them all out first, a bit faster. Okay, and now I'll just put in the, the signs. So those are four different projectors, right? This, this is the one I already uh, did before, E1 of um, XX uh, intersect E1 of ZZ. That's the space it projects onto. But the other three, um, I haven't really defined or understood, frankly. I mean, we can, of course, do the same thing as we did here. But the point is that all of these, we claim, will project onto orthogonal spaces. That's, that's claim number one. Okay, so that's claim one. Why should this be true? So what does it mean to be orthogonal? Like when I have two projectors and I claim that they project onto orthogonal spaces, that means that if I were to multiply the two projectors, right, they should go to zero, the scalar zero, because they live in completely different spaces. And so let's just test. Let's just do one pairing, right? And let's just make sure that they really are orthogonal, right? So let me choose this projector, right? The one onto the space we care about, E1. Right? And let me just multiply it by the second projector, this one over here, minus xx pi zz, okay? So what was this? Remember that um, this was just, I'm just gonna pull out scalars here. So I'm pulling out the factor of a half in both terms. This was just identity plus xx over, uh, sorry, I just said I'm gonna pull out the scalar, so let me pull it out. And here this is identity plus zz, okay, that's, coming from there. And now what does this give me? This gives me another factor of a quarter and identity minus xx times identity plus zz, okay? And now what's the point? The point here is that um, we can just expand these things out, right? And in particular, um, life is easy because you know I have one over 16 here. Let me just pull the scalars together. These terms will commute, right? Because xx and zz commute, um, the whole bracket itself will commute as well. So what I can certainly do is I can do i plus xx um, times identity minus xx, just move it over. And then I've got identity plus cz times identity plus cz. Okay, and this is again since xx and zz commute. Okay. And now you can just expand this out, right? And uh, what you'll see here is that you'll get, you know, identity here, um, minus xx, right, plus xx, and then minus identity when you expand out this first one. 
And, and now you're already done, right? Because who cares what this thing is? This thing is zero. Okay, so um, this is why the sign flips help us, right? Plus minus uh, takes us to orthogonal spaces. Okay, so indeed these two are orthogonal projectors because their product goes to zero. This is not surprising at all, right? Because x, x, and z, z, remember, they only have plus minus one eigenspaces. And if I think about x, x, and I, um, I hit the whole thing with a minus one, then we're basically swapping the plus and the minus one eigenspaces. And so that's why we expect that, you know, this thing and this thing should project onto orthogonal spaces, right? This projects onto the plus one eigenspace of x, x. This intuitively projects onto the minus one eigenspace of x, x. So clearly their product should go to zero. Good, so now we hopefully believe that I've written down four projectors that project onto orthogonal spaces. Now, again, feel free to pause the video and think about what more do I need to prove to argue that really um, I'm cutting my pizza into four equal slices. Okay, so this gives me uh, orthogonal uh, projectors, or spaces I should say. Now, the other two things I need are, number one, nobody said that these spaces are non-empty, first of all. I don't even know if they're empty or not, right? And number two, I need them all to be equal size. Okay, once they're non-empty, then I need them to be equal size. So to show that they're non-empty, the spaces, da, 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 where was that? Over here, this is an X exercise, 12.25. So the space is non-empty. One way to see that is to just very quickly add these things, right? So add all four of them. So I'm not gonna write them all out. Add the very last one in the sequence, right? Right, so this thing, so this is, take these four operators, right? These four projectors and add them. And what you'll get when you do this is you'll just get identity. I mean, technically identity on two qubits, so let me just say ii, right? So in other words, what that means is that um, you know these projectors cannot be projecting you onto empty spaces, right? At least one of them has to be non-empty, otherwise you just can't get identity on the right. By the way, to, to say that this projects onto an empty space, of course, that means that the product of these two is zero. Good, so now I know that I have four orthogonal spaces and they're all non-empty, or sorry, at least one of them is non-empty. And so now the final piece of the puzzle is to argue that all of them in fact have the exact same size, the same dimension. Okay, so I've got pizza slices, at least one of them is not, um, a proper pizza slice. Now I want my slices to be identical in size. And so this part of the argument so far, these first two steps, this kind of straightforwardly generalizes to any n, right, and to any generating set, right? So, you know, we're thinking about this basic case of xx and zz, but the, the argument generalizes in the exact same way, right? The projectors are, um, you know, you just write down um, all of your stabilizers, right? In this case, I had two of them, so I have the product of pi xx and pi zz, but if I had, say, k stabilizers, then I would just write down the, the product of the projectors onto all of them, and then, you know, I would flip the signs on each of them one by one, right? And since I have k stabilizers in general, um, there will be two to the k different ways to set the signs on um, all those projectors, and therefore, I get two to the k generators. This can be done in a straightforward fashion, so let me not say more about that. The one that needs a bit more work in general, it won't be so difficult in this setting, but in general, is how do you prove that they all have the, exactly the same size now? They project onto the same dimensional space. So now this is the question, how to show um, pi xx, pi zz, uh, dot, 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 um, the last one, all four of these project onto space of same size. Okay, and the answer is that um, we're gonna use a, a clever observation, right? This is exercise 12.26, and it has nothing to do with quantum, right? It's just linear algebra. And basically it's that conjugation by unitary preserves rank. Okay, and so what this means is that um, for all unitary u and um, normal operator a, let's just stay in like a um, diagonalizable world, the rank of a, right, equals to the rank of u a u dagger. 
So first, why does this hold? Well, I mean, just think about it this way, right? I mean, um, if, if A is normal, then I could write down a spectral decomposition. And so remember that when I take a spectral decomposition and I conjugate with the unitary, all it does is it changes the eigenbasis, right? It does not change the eigenvalues, right? It's just a change of basis. And the rank is fully dependent on the eigenvalues, right? It doesn't care about the eigenbasis. So therefore, the rank does not change under unitary. And by the way, you know, this statement holds uh, much more generally. I mean, for example, A doesn't even have to be normal. It doesn't even have to be square, right? You can make a similar argument. Then you worry about things like row rank versus column rank, and you use the singular value decomposition. But the idea is the same. OK, so now why do we want this, right? Well, the reason is because you know, the dimension of the space that each one of these projects onto is nothing other than the rank of that projector. Okay, So the observation here is that um, the dimension uh, projected onto by, say, um, you know, pi xx pi zz is the rank of this projector. OK, right? But I just told you that the rank is invariant under unitary. So if I can find a unitary u such that you know it'll map, if I apply it to, say, this first guy, it'll take me to one of the other ones. Right, I had four projectors. Let's look at, say, the second one. If I can find, sorry, my example I'm going to do, um, sorry, let's do a plus here and let's do a minus here. If I can find a unitary u so that under conjugation, it takes me from the first projector to the, uh, to the third projector, I think we said, then by this previous exercise right here, I know that um, both those projectors must have the same rank. So then uh, the rank of pi, sorry, let me scroll this up, make sure you can see it, rank of pi xx, pi zz equals to the rank of pi xx, pi minus. Okay, that's just by this exercise up here. Okay, and, and hence the, di the dimensions of the spaces they project onto are the same. This is the argument we're going to do. So we're going to divide, uh, devise a very simple u, actually, that does exactly this mapping. Okay, and of course, uh, we want to show that all four of these projectors, where were they? There they are, right? I want to show that all four of them have the same rank, hence pro they project onto spaces of the same dimension. And um, so therefore, I need to write down unitaries that take uh, four unitaries, sorry, three unitaries, right? One that takes you from here to here, one that takes you from here to here, and finally, one that takes you from here to the last one. And therefore, all four of these must have the same rank. And that completes uh, the proof, at least for this case of x and xx and zz. So how do we choose this unitary that does this particular mapping? Let's just focus on one special case, and I'll leave the rest as an exercise. That is exercise now 12.27, and we'll do this together. And the claim is this. Define u equals to poly x on qubit 1 and an identity on qubit 2. OK, so this is what I claim is u. And now um, let's do u of pi xx, pi zz. OK, what is that? I claim I'm going to get, of course, uh, this thing on the right. right I'm, I'm going to go to one of the other projectors. So let's see why this is true. Um, so what is u? Well, this is x tensor i, right? And then I have, you know, up to scalar. Let me just pull out the scalars again. Identity plus xx. And then I have identity plus cz. And then I have x tensor i again. Right, and let me undo this. OK, so what happens here? Well, you know, this is x tensor i. These two are going to commute, right? They're both x operators. So the order I multiply anything in is not going to matter, right? But here, um, so let's first do that. Let's just do step by step, quarter. And so what I'll get is I will get um, identity plus xx x tensor identity, right? Uh, let me maybe be a little bit more consistent in my notation. xi, right? And here I still have i plus x and zz, and here I have xi. OK, and now, of course, I want to move uh, this one past here, right? And now I have a slight problem because um, 
this thing over here, right? Um, so these two, of course, commute, right? Because identity commutes with everything. But these two, they anti-commute, right? Because um, I have a single poly X and a single poly Z. Um, so those two guys will anti-commute. And the identity commutes with the Z. So I only get to kick out one copy of a minus one. And that's why we get uh, the claim, which is that when I work this out, I will get identity plus XX. And then I will get um, identity minus. So this is where the minus comes in. Uh, ZZ. And then I get XI squared, right? And this, of course, just goes to identity. So this is nothing other than, as we claimed, pi xx, that's this one, and pi uh, minus cz, that's this one. Okay, so that's exactly what I claimed up here, right? So we conclude that the rank of these two operators must be the same, and so these two project onto the same um, dimensional space. And so the only thing that's left now is, you know, you want to repeat this, right? There were four projectors. We want to show that they're all the same dimension. I'm not going to explicitly do this. So exercise 12.28 um, will get you to argue that, um, you know, you can find other unitaries. Um, you know, I gave this one you, but there, there are other unitaries that will take you from this projector to um, the other two projectors, basically, in that list. Okay, and that's basically it. Once we have this, we have all the facts we need, right? We've got four projectors. Uh, they project onto orthogonal spaces, number one. The spaces, at least one space is non-empty. And finally, all the spaces have equal size. And therefore, I've got uh, four projectors. They cut up my Hilbert space into four equal, si equal dimensional spaces. One of the projectors is the one I care about. It's this one, onto E1 of um, XX uh, intersect E1 of ZZ. And therefore, this one must share a quarter of the full dimension of the space. Space is four dimensional. Therefore, the dimension of this is one. Okay. And so, um, so the dimension of E1 of um, XX ZZ is equal to one. Oops, is equal to one. And that's not surprising, right? Because remember, we said earlier that you know, we did this exercise where we literally simultaneously diagonalized xx and zz, uh, zz. And we saw that indeed, right, the unique state um, was the Bell state. Okay, so we did it explicitly, but this theorem allows us to recover this uniqueness um, like this, right? Just with the formula, you just tell me um, what is k, I tell you the, the, the dimension basically of the stabilized space. Okay? So that's just the main. Um, I already erased that lemma, or did I leave it here? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So this basically says that uh, again, if I have k independent generators on n qubits, then the size of the joint space that's stabilized basically drops by a factor of two each time we add one additional generator. Okay. So I need n generators in order to stabilize a unique uh, space in the one I get, joint eigenspace. Good. That's all I want to say about necessary and sufficient conditions for when um, our stabilizer is non-empty. So now we know um, essentially how to stabilize uh, some desired state. Okay. And now we can finally get to um, the actual proof of the Gottman's Monkey theorem, which, you know, at this point, um, the main difficulty is kind of setting up this framework. The rest, I mean, it, there are some nice uh, slick tricks we can apply to, to get the result relatively easily, let's say. Um, one thing I do want to mention is, you know, if you want to generalize the, the proof we sketched here to general, um, you know, here I only talked about XX and ZZ, right? But you can do it, of course, for general S. And again, the first two steps of this, right, where you define the projectors and you show they're orthogonal and non-empty, those, those parts are easy, they're straightforward to generalize. The slightly trickier part is, well, how in the world do you generalize this part, right? Which is that we have to find this unitary that would take you from the, the projector I care about to all the other projectors one by one. And that you can generalize um, in a, you know, with not too much work, but it requires something called uh, the notion of a check matrix. And you know, I, do, I don't want to introduce more formalism at this point. 
Okay, so let's just leave it at that. Certainly the, the basic ideas are all here, right? Okay, so finally we have the proof of the Gottesman Canal theorem. And this is 12.2. So let me just remind you what this said, right? Um, we set up all this framework now, and all we want to argue is that there's a very nice class of uh, circuits which we can simulate classically using the stabilizers of formalism. And what were we allowed to do? Or we were allowed to start with all zeros as a standard. We are allowed to, at the end to measure in the standard basis, so that means that I could do tau the observable z on all the qubits if I like. And finally, the gates I'm allowed to apply were da, 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 um, Hadamard, C0, Pauli XYZ, and uh, the so-called phase gate. Right? If you don't remember the definition, it, it's not entirely important at this point. Good. So we basically just have to show how to do these three things in the stabilizer formalism. Okay, that's, that's the remainder of our proof sketch. So let's start with one. Right? How do we start? How do we stabilize the all zero state to begin with? What's the stabilizer for the all zero state? Okay, and this is actually um, exercise uh, twelve point three one, but it's fairly easy, right? So what do we know? I want to stabilize the state of all zeros, right? I want to write down a, a set of generators S so that there's a unique stabilized state, and that is all zeros. So. The first observation is by the lemma we just showed, right? In order to do this, I need precisely n generators, right? So I need n independent generators. And they need to pairwise commute, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so what do I do? Well, just consider this, right? How do I get, just do it for one qubit, right? Because this is a tensor product state. So once you do it for one qubit, you could just repeat the same thing on all the qubits. So if I want to force the first qubit to be zero, Right? then I project onto the one eigenspace of Pauli z, right? because that is uh, the operator with z, um, one, a zero as its first. Um, okay, let me just write down the equation. <laughs> Good, right? So remember that this is a one eigenvector of z. Okay? So that works for one qubit, and now I want to do this for all the qubits. You might be tempted to, to do this, right? And, well, um, certainly this is true, right? But this is not enough, right? This is, this is wrong. You don't want to do this, right? Because this is only one state generator. And if I only have one generator, then the space I'm generating, um, I'm stabilizing, will be 2 to the n minus 1, right? Not 1. Um, and so remember that, you know, you can also get, this will also have one eigenvectors which have an even parity, or even Hamming weight, sorry. So of course what we want to do is we want to have n generators, and we just want to repeat this trick here, right? So therefore, choose S equal to Z1. So we just project it's Z1 tensor identity everywhere else, Z2 tensor identity on everywhere else, all the way up to Zn tensor identity on everywhere else. OK, I don't want to write the identities so it doesn't get all cluttered. OK, uh, yeah, so slow. OK, no, don't do that. Scratch that. Okay. So this is my stabilizer. Okay, so you know, for example, think of it as like this. Look, if I just have three qubits, it looks like this. So well, this is when n equals to three. Okay, so just visualize it this way. Where did my z's go? Interesting. Okay. So this is how I stabilize the the joint zero state. Okay, so there's one unique eigenstate, right? One eigenvector, and this is just the all zeros state. Okay, so uh, so that gives me um, how to represent the start state. And now, of course, the next thing I need is, well, how do I simulate gates? And of course, I don't need to do all the gates, but just the gates in my sequence. Okay, and so here we're basically just going to use a bunch of identities and um, some nice observations, right? And so what's the idea, right? So of course, you know, let's say 
Um, normally, if I had, so this gate simulation. So normally, what I would do is, you know, if I had a state psi, right, and I apply a unitary u, then I would write down the state u psi, right, to track this simulation of the gate. But of course, the, the whole point of this lecture is that I don't want to do this, right? I don't want to write down psi as a big long vector. So instead, remember, I'm instead of representing psi, I, I'm writing down a set of uh, generators, right? Um, well, instead I have um, a set S of generators, right? And now I want to understand, you know, how do those generators get updated, right? They uniquely represent a state. How do they get updated uh, when I apply U to the state psi that I'm implicitly representing? Okay, and, you know, this may sound complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, basically consider this. Pick any element of your generator, S, I mean, it could also be in the, the generated set, uh, the subgroup. What do we know? I know that, um, you know, u psi is what I actually cared about, right? But of course, what I can do is I can insert g in here, right? And this is just simply because um, g stabilizes my state psi. Um, sorry, uh, let me be clear here. Psi uh, in E1 of s, I should be clear, right? So g stabilizes the state, so I could always stick it in there. It's a one eigenvector. Uh, psi is a one eigenvector of g, right? And now, of course, I could do yet another trick, which is that u u dagger is always identity, right? So I get u g, and I could always just plug in a u u dagger wherever I feel like it, okay? Because u is unitary. And then, of course, I'm just going to exact same expression. Let me just put the brackets somewhere else to focus on what I want to focus on. And so now let's stare at what we have, okay? I started with um, this guy, right? And I ended up with that guy up to this, right? So what does this mean? This means that whereas psi used to be uh, uh, stabilized by g, right? Here it is. Now u of psi, my new state, isn't stabilized by g anymore, right? Here's u of psi. It's stabilized by g conjugated by u, okay? So in other words, if I want to update my stabilizer generators g, right, to now encode not psi, but u times psi, then all I have to do is I just need to conjugate each of my generators by uh, u, okay? So in other words, I want to map my set of generators to this. And you know, let me be clear what I mean by this. This is a set of all, uh, whatever generators I have in here, I'm just, each of them, I'm gonna do this, right? That's what this, uh, sorry, let me focus and go up a bit. That's what this trick is saying. Okay, I could do it on each of the generators instead. Okay, so that's the first observation, right? So in other words, you know, in one sentence, all this says is that if I want to simulate u on my state psi, because I'm not actually working with psi directly, instead of applying u to psi, I instead apply u to the stabilizer elements. And it has the exact same effect. Okay, again, I still have, um, when I do this, of course, I'll still have, you know, the same number of generators and they will still be independent because u is just a, a change of basis that's consistent for all the generators now. So that's good, right? Um, of course, I have no idea what this will look like, right? I mean, when I, each of my Gs used to be in these really nice Pauli strings like XXZ or something like this, right? But now you, in principle, could be some uh, nasty gate that, so that, you know, when I do this conjugation, the result is some really nasty thing that looks nothing like a Pauli string. Okay, that, that's my fear because, like I said, when we formalize the stabilizer framework, you know, we always want to first set down the rules of the game. What is the sandbox we're playing in? What are, what are we allowed to do? And the sandbox we're playing in is the Pauli group, right? I do not ever want to see a generator that is not a Pauli string, right? If I ever leave the Pauli group, everything I've set up is, breaks down, right? And so intuitively, what this says is that the choice of u I apply, when I conjugate g by it, right, I should always get as output another Pauli string. I should never get something that's not in the Pauli group, okay? And, you know, surprise, surprise, the set of unitaries we chose in the, the goddesman knill theorem turns out to be precisely the set of unitaries that send Pauli strings to Pauli strings. 
So observation two is that um, H C naught, um, what else did we have? We had poly X, Y, Z, and S. These basically, I mean, these operate, these unitaries and any product of them, so the, the group of unitaries generated by them, right? These guys basically map um, Pauli strings to Pauli strings. Okay, ta-da! That means that, you know, these guys were a, a sequence of Pauli strings, and then when I conjugate by U, for U chosen from this set, right, that's important, then I know that the outputs will just be some other uh, string, a uh, set of Pauli strings. And so I still stay in my sandbox. I stay in the stabilizer framework. Okay, so let's just do a quick example. Uh, and so by the way, um, these guys, they basically generate, let me do this, the fancy name we gave to this is the, the Clifford group, which basically is a fancy way of saying that um, these are gonna be the set of all unitaries, all U, such that um, for all um, G in, so take any Pauli string, U, G, U dagger is still some other Pauli string potentially, but it's still a Pauli string. Sorry, let me scroll up, it might take a second. Okay, so we stay in the, the set of Pauli operators. Okay, there it goes. Okay, so um, I mean, let's just very briefly convince ourselves of this fact. Right, so um, the simple, let me just do a very simple example, right? Again, let's just go back to our lovely example of XX, right? So that's a Pauli string. And if I define um, U, let's just say as just a Hadamard gate, right? Because I'm allowed to apply Hadamard, right? So let's just do Hadamard tensor identity. This is my U. Okay, and uh, um, remember I'm conjugating. This is important. Here's a U dagger. In this case, U equals to U dagger, but, but fine. So what is this? I mean, let's just work it out. Well, Hadamard tensor X, right? This is Hadamard X, Hadamard dagger, tensor just X. And remember, this is nothing other than Pauli Z, right? Because uh, X and Z are related up to this basis change Hadamard. But this is also um, a Pauli string, right? I started with a Pauli string and I got another Pauli string. Boom, right? That's the magic of the framework, right? And that also explains the very specific choice of gates um, in the statement of the Gottesman Knill theorem, right? We, we cannot allow arbitrary gates because if I do arbitrary gates, then over here I'm going to be in trouble, right? When I do, if I do arbitrary gates, like the T gate, for example, um, the result will no longer be um, a Pauli string. And that's why we instead use these gates. Okay, these ones make sure that when I conjugate it, a Pauli string by one of those gates, I end up with yet another Pauli string. So um, what we've observed now, and I haven't fully proven, um, you know, all the stuff about the Clifford group, but, you know, just believe me that, uh, well, I mean, we'll see in a second, but these guys really do map Pauli strings to Pauli strings, and, you know, we'll see why in a second, right? But in fact, they're everything you need to generate the full cl Clifford group, okay? They, so they capture everything in terms of what preserves Pauli strings. And so the only thing we need to care about is, is just this, right? So now I have some generators. Remember, over here, I had some list of generators, G1 through G2, G2 and so forth. And I want to apply one of the Clifford gates. And so the question is, how do I update my generator? What does U, G1, U dagger look like in general? And the nice thing is that when you take one of these gates, um, there's a very clean, succinct formula for what U, G1, U dagger will look like. So let me just write out the formulas because that's literally the only thing that's left. So, so how do Clifford gates change the stabilizer generators. Okay, so if I have a, remember what are the, the what gates was I allowed? I was allowed to do a power had a mard, that was my first Clifford gate. I'm technically a dagger, but it doesn't matter, right? 
And so how did uh, these Pauli strings, X and Z, change under the Hadamard? Well, this we already know, right? It's just Z and X, it just swaps them. That's old news. You'll notice, by the way, I'm, you know, in, in principle, I should also do this, right? Because for a Pauli string, I should also consider HY a dagger, because Pauli strings can have Pauli Y at a certain location. But the point is that uh, this is, I don't need to do it explicitly. And why is that? Well, remember that I could always write uh, y, well, x times z, I think we calculated this was i times y. Okay, so as long as I know uh, how the Hadamard acts on these two operators, which I do, I can already immediately infer what it does on the y operator. So this is why I'm not going to bother writing out y explicitly. Okay, so that's the first Clifford gate. Um, I'm not going to write down anything for the Clifford gates X, Y, Z because those are Pauli out operators themselves and we know exactly how they act on Pauli strings, right? They anti-commute with things, right? So I'm not going to do that. And technically speaking, in fact, the Pauli operators are not necessary to generate the full Clifford group. You actually, it turns out, only need Hadamard, Phase, and C0. Okay, so let me do those ones. So here's your the Phase gate. And again, this is um, X and Z. As my poly string and so it turns out that you know you can just work it out literally there's no magic here you just do the math right and what you'll get is this and last but not least let's do the c naught and with c naught you have to be slightly more careful right because in c naught there are two qubits now right and the first qubit typically you know remember when i write this notation i, I typically mean that the first qubit is the control the second qubit is the target so here I need to worry about four cases, right? I can worry about when the, there's an X on one position and an identity on a second. Okay, so it's the same. It's always C naught one to two. I'm not going to write it every time. So I'll write this four times. And the only thing that will change is here I'll do identity tensor X2, um, Z1 tensor identity, identity tensor Z2. Okay. And you know, how does the this last Clifford gate act on the space? Well, it takes each of these four operators to x1, x2, identity x, z identity, and z1, z2. Okay, so you stick in a poly string, you get out a poly string. Okay, and, and that's the name of the game. This is why um, the Clifford gates and the stabilizer framework play so nicely together. Okay, and this is essentially why we were able to track the evolution because um, all I have to do is I, I always have n generators throughout the entire evolution, right? And every time I apply a Clifford gate, all I have to do is just um, kind of locally conjugate it onto my n generators. This takes order in time, right? And therefore I can update all of my n generators uh, in linear time essentially with each gate to do the simulation. Amazing, right? So one thing you might ask is, you know, uh, well, let's do a full example. Right, um, because um, you might wonder why in the world am I not doing x tensor x? Whoops. Like, why did I only do, um, say, x tensor um, identity, for example? And again, this is without loss generality, so let me just do a full example of how the simulation works. So let's suppose, you know, again, I have my list of generators. So suppose my first generator was this one x1, z2 x3, z4, let's just say. Okay, so I have a list of them. This is just the first generator in my list. And at this point in the circuit, I wanted to apply a C naught from one to two. Okay, and I wanna simulate this again by applying it, um, in not to my implicitly specified state, but instead to the generators. Okay, so let me just apply it to the first generator. Okay, and so what happens now? Well, what I'm gonna do is I mean, this only acts on qubits one and two, right? One is the control, two is the target. So I don't really care about three and four, right? That's not gonna play any role here. So I really only care about this X and Z in the beginning. And you know, the slight problem is that I never defined what happens on X, Z directly, right? I only said X times identity, um, I tensor Z. But of course, the naive observation here is that, you know, if I just multiply this one and this one, I get exactly X, Z. So let me just do that, right? C naught. So I'll just factor this out, I'll do X, times identity four times, okay, C naught. Now let me be clear that this is all C naught one two times, C naught one two, okay, let me scroll this up. Um, and 
this is going to be identity um, z x z. Okay. So I just split things apart in the in the trivial way. Okay. So there's the x. That's that one, and the, the z here is here, and then you have your string at the end, which I don't care about because the c naught doesn't even act on that. Okay, but now life is good because I have formulas for these things, right? I know exactly how c naught acts on x tensor identity, which is this thing. So then I'm going to get x x uh, i i. Okay, that's just from the first row up here. And now uh, for the second one, uh, I know that i tensor z goes to z z. So that's from this thing over here. And now I just have to multiply this out. And again, I know the rules uh, for the Pauli operators, right? So the last two operators, of course, these don't change at all. Right? They're just going to be xz again. Maybe I should write out tensor products now. But of course, now I have x times z. And remember that um, x times z is going to be equal to um, minus i y tensor minus i y. OK? That's just the, the formula, what happens when you multiply x times z. And of course, now we just expand this out. And you will get, um, as a result, you know, minus i squared is just minus 1. And then you get y, y, x, z. Done. OK, so to simulate the action of the c naught, you know, to update the stabilized state, I just replace this in my generator list. Let's say this was g1 with this, g1 prime. OK, and I do this for all the generators, of course. And now, ta-da, my new set of generators reflects the C0 having been applied to my joint one eigenstates. Again, magic, right? I mean, whether it's black magic or uh, good magic, let's say, that I leave to you, right? Uh, but I think it's pretty amazing, right? OK, now, last but not least, measurements. Okay, so let's just quickly understand why we can do the last thing, which is we needed to measure in the standard basis, right? And um, let's do that. So three measurements. Okay, so here, you know, again, I'll leave a little bit to exercise, but here's the basic idea. Okay, so um, just like before, right, suppose we have um, psi in uh, C2 to the n, right, so it's 9 qubit state. And we're, it's stabilized, it's the unique state stabilized by these generators, S equals to um, you know, S1 dot Sn, right? I have n generators, that means I get a unique uh, stabilized state, assuming the generators uh, commute and are independent. Okay, and remember what we want to do is want to now uh, measure the observable. Um, let's just say, uh, you know, for, for our purposes, let's just say I want to measure every single qubit in the standard basis. Okay, this is my goal. I want to simulate the measurement of this observable. Okay, so how do I simulate it? You know, how do I figure out the measurement statistics and how do I update my state to the post measurement state? Right, so in other words, um, you know, what new stabilizer generators do we go to? Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is um, remember that this thing has two eigenspaces, right? Plus one and minus one. Okay, so what we call E1 and E minus one. So um, to make life easy, I don't want to write this out every time. Let me just call this Z bar, right? So it's, it's a big Z on all the ends, right? And I'm going to define pi plus and pi minus to be the projections onto the plus one and the minus one eigenspaces. Right? So this is um, identity plus z bar right, over 2. And this one, remember, is identity minus z bar over 2. OK, so this projects onto the plus one space. And this one does the minus one space. OK, so these are the two projectors. And of course, um, when I make a projective measurement um, relative to this observable, you know, there are only two outcomes, right? There are two eigenvalues, plus one, minus one. And so I want to know, um, remember what I want to know is, you know, to want to know, not that I do know. I want to know, for example, the state side that I'm stabilizing, what is this thing, right? 
right? That tells me what is the probability of observing plus one as my outcome when I do the measurement um, according to observable z bar. Okay? Okay, so now it turns out that um, there are really only two cases that can take place in terms of the types of distributions you can see when you measure. Okay, so we'll just go through them one by one. And again, as always, it has to do with, you know, I'm trying to measure this, right? I'm going to figure out measurement probabilities just by looking at the stabilizers. So that, and this itself, by the way, is a Pauli string, right? Um, so this is important. We're going to allow measurements in arbitrary Pauli strings, but, you know, the one we care about here is the standard basis, so all Zs. But of course, remember that um, I care about the relationship between this observable, Z bar, and um, my string of generators, my list of generators. And in particular, I'll care about the commutation properties. So the first case is, uh, the nice case in some sense, is that if it turns out that my measurement Z bar actually commutes with all the generators, then things work out a little bit cleaner for all I in N. The measurement I want to make, this is my Z bar, commutes with all my generators. Okay, that's what this says. Okay. And uh, case two is the case where this won't hold, basically, right? There'll be at least one generator with which Z bar anti commutes. But first, let's uh, do this case. And so the claim here is that whenever this happens, something really nice and easy to work with happens. And you know, I won't prove it here. I'll let you prove it in the exercises. Is that either uh, Z bar, like my measurement observable, either that itself is in the stabilizer. So this is my uh, stabilizer, or minus that bar is in the stabilizer. Okay, so precisely one of these two is in the stabilizer. Okay, and so this is um, exercises 12 point, exercises 12.34 uh, and exercises 12.35, uh, and I'll let you work through those on your own. Okay, uh, again, they're just, um, of simple playing around with the stabilizers and so forth and using similar tricks to before and so now let's suppose i mean what we know is that um, z bar commutes with all these generators and in particular i know that um either therefore z bar is in uh, the stabilizer itself like is in the yeah or minus z bar is okay so what does this mean? So there, um, if Z bar is in my stabilizer, then by definition, what this means is that, you know, if I look at psi, Z bar psi, right? Because this was my, um, this is gonna be the expected value of my measurement, right? Then, you know, this thing is just gonna be equal to psi psi, right? Because I just said that, you know, Z is in the stabilizer, right? So Z times uh, psi must just be psi, okay? And so this basically means that the expected value is always going to be one. So this means that, um, remember, I only have two possible outcomes, one and minus one. If the expected value is one of the extreme points, it's one, that means that I always see one. So it means we always uh, see one, okay, as the measurement outcome. And in the other case, it's the opposite, right? So if I had psi, in this case, if I want to know what is the expected outcome, well, um, because minus c is in, uh, the stabilizer, right? That means that what I can do is I could write this as psi um, minus minus z, right? I'm just literally doing absolutely nothing clever here. And you know, you should, it's not as, sorry, this is a product, right? I, I do want to be clear. And then of course, now this just equals to um, psi and then technically there's a minus one here now and psi. Okay, so it's just minus uh, one essentially because now minus z stabilizes psi, right? That's what I just said. So in this case, um, I always see minus one. Okay, so um, it's very easy to kind of, uh, in this sense, understand the measurement statistics uh, when the measurement observable I actually had in mind, you know, happens to already be in the stabilizer, right? It's, it's just gonna be deterministic, 
just like a classical computation at this point, right? It's always going to output one or, or minus one, just like a, a P machine would, for example. Okay, and finally, let's talk about the second case, case two, which is when this criteria doesn't hold, right? Um, okay, so when this criteria doesn't hold, then of course the the other case is that for some i, we have an empty computation happening. So formally, it, it means that this is uh, not equal to zero for some i, and this of course means that, uh, sorry, uh, ZGI is the anti commute now instead. Okay? And now the claim is that in this case, um, if I measure, right, the probability of, and remember I said um, psi plus, uh, sorry, pi plus was going to be my projector onto the plus one eigenspace. Um, this is going to be the same thing. The probability of seeing a plus one is going to be the same as a minus one. This was a projector onto the eigen, minus one eigenspace. And, well, there are only two outcomes, so therefore they must both be a half. That's the claim. Okay. Okay, so I mean, we can very quickly sketch this. It's, it's actually an exercise, but it's instructive to just see it. And we can just do it literally. Um, pi plus psi, right? What is this equal to? I want to claim it's equal to pi minus psi. Well, I mean, just write out the definition of pi plus, right? We said that pi plus was identity plus z bar over two. Okay. And, um, What do I know? I know that, um, you know, the only thing I know uh, I have at my disposal here is that, you know, there's a generator for my state, right, which anti-commutes with z, right? So what does that mean? That means that, you know, if I want, I could just write the same thing out. You know, so far, no changes. But now I could kick out this generator, right, over here. I can bring this out because I know this generator stabilizes psi, so I could always pop it in if I want. And so what do I know? Well, I know that, um, well, if I were to take this G now, because it anti-commutes with uh, Z, if I were to move it past the Z in this expression, like to swap the order, then a minus sign is going to come out, right? Um, of course, if I move GI past the identity, the identity commutes with everything. So there you don't get a sign. So just like before, this was similar to a previous argument, I can move the GI to the left side if I want, right? And uh, because it anti-commutes with z-bar, I'm going to get a minus sign there now. Okay, this is all I did. And now um, I'm going to use another trick, which we didn't explicitly state, but actually... Um, these generators, you can argue, are always going to be Hermitian. And uh, that's an exercise in the notes. It's, it's not difficult to see it at all. And if they're Hermitian... Um, GIs are always Hermitian. Okay, I mean, it's not difficult to see it because if they're not Hermitian and they're Pauli strings, then when you square them, it's very easy to get a, a minus identity coming out, which, remember, was not allowed for our stabilizers. Okay, and so now, but um, we, we know that psi is um, stabilized by GI, so this is just the, the bra of that expression, right? So this is just psi again. By definition, this is the projector onto that minus space we said. So I have plus, I have minus, I have my claim. Okay. So in this case, uh, it turns out that um, the probability of seeing both outcomes, plus one or minus one, is exactly the same. And there are only two outcomes. So therefore, um, from this, we already conclude that both the probabilities must be exactly half. There's a, a little bit more subtlety that I'm, I'm going to skip over in the actual lecture itself, which is that um, we, can, we need to assume in this uh, discussion without loss generality that you know, we said that there's some i right with which my measurement anti-commutes, some generator. But we need to assume that z actually commutes with all the other generators. And this is actually without loss of generality. 
turns out that if you happen to NT commute with more than one GI, then that's fine. You could always, um, in a very kind of trivial way, map your set of generators to a new set of generators so that you only NT commute with GI and with everybody else you now commute. And so the argument will go through. Right? So see if you can spot um, why that's important. So this is um, exercise, uh, da, da, da. well, it's actually exercise 12.37 and 12.38. Okay, but let me not cover it in the interest of time. Finally, uh, the last thing we need. Okay, so now we understand measurement statistics, right? It's either gonna be deterministically zero or one, depending on, uh, so just like a classical computation, depending on uh, whether or not, um, if the measurement you're making is in the stabilizer, if it's not in the stabilizer, right, if it anti-commutes with one of the generators, then it's like flipping a, a fair coin, basically. And so the last thing we care about is, well, what is the post-measurement state? Okay. And so, again, this is not very difficult, but I'm just going to state it. Okay, and we'll close. And it says that, um, again, there are two cases, right? So in case one, what do I know? I know that, remember that either my measurement or it's um, my observable or it's negation is in the stabilizer, right? And so what does that mean? That means that essentially um, the measurement I made, remember, occurred with certainty, right? I always got one or I always got minus one, right? So that essentially says that my state doesn't change, right? There's no disturbance that's happening. So state doesn't change. Right, so that's the nice thing about deterministic outcomes, right? You, states don't change. And this means that the, the stabilizer is unchanged. S unchanged. Right, so we don't actually need to update our generators at all in this case. So let's instead talk about case two. Okay, so in case two, um, it's slightly more complicated, but you know, again, not difficult. And the claim here is that, um, and here's where we want to use so if we assume, I mentioned this earlier, if we assume now that, um, I, you know, so what do I know in this case? Let me just remind you. We said that this one anti-commutes with GI. That was case two. If we assume that um, this guy commutes with all GJ um, for J not equal to I, and as I said earlier, this is actually without loss of generality, so we can make this assumption and I leave that to you as an exercise, why it's without loss of generality. So if we assume that it commutes with all the other generators, it just anti-commutes with one generator, then um, we can update um, the post-measurement stabilizer to um, either um, G1 through, you know, GI minus one, right? Because remember GI was the one that, um, here's GI, right? That, that's the one that anti-commuted with my operator. So I'll write down all the other ones first that don't change. And I have N of them, remember? And um, so these things will be the same here. And now I'll see if we get a, a plus one. And here I'll get, if I get a minus one. Okay, so what, what happens to the generators then? Well, in the first case, um, it turns out that the right thing to do is to put um, Z bar here. And in the second case, the right thing to do is to put a minus Z bar. Okay, and again, I'll let you prove that. Okay. So in this case, uh, in case two, when you make the measurement, you know, depending on um, the outcome you get, you know, it's very easy to update the stabilizer again. You just need to throw out the generator with, with which you anti-commuted and replace it with either your observable or minus your observable, depending on uh, which outcome, right? So, I mean, for example, like you have the stabilizer, right? Um, and you're supposed to basically to simulate the measurement, what do you do? You know, you have your stabilizer, you know, at this case, like it, you find an anti-commutation happening, right? You're like, okay, so what you do is you just classically flip a fair coin, right? If you get heads or like, let's say plus one, then you update your state to this. If you get tails uh, minus one, um, then you update your stabilizer to this, right? So you classically simulate the measurement quite literally. Okay, so that is the end of today's lecture. And um, so let me just recap. 
today we talked about the general theme. Like we talked a lot in this course about, you know, how great quantum computers are and, you know, they are so much better than classical computers and so forth. But it's of course important to see both sides of the coin, right? Um, in what cases can you actually simulate uh, quantum circuits efficiently? And in this lecture, we saw how to use the, the framework of stabilizers, right, as an alternate way to describe quantum states in such a way that um, indeed we can simulate a certain class of gates on quantum states efficiently. Okay, even if they produce like very entangled states and so forth, it's still possible to do the simulation. And it only works because we're not writing down the explicit state vector. It's because we're tracking our state in a different representation implicitly as a joint one eigenspace of some set of um, power strings. Okay, and the name we give to this nice result is the so-called Gottesman Knoll theorem. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. So um, yeah, that's it. As always, please uh, stay healthy. You know, I really hate the fact that uh, a year after uh, the last lectures in 2020 were recorded, this 2021, and I still have to end these lectures with stay healthy and COVID is still going. So as always, please do stay healthy. Um, and see you next time.